everyone. My name is Professor Douglas Bourne. I'm Director of the Development Education Research Centre at University College London, and I'm also Chair of the Academic Network of Global Education and Learning. The whole purpose of this event is to showcase research by people currently undertaking doctoral level research or recently completed their doctorates. And it's a way of showcasing their, wor their work and to, and to um, promote it and within the international network. Those of you who are not aware of ANGEL, the network was set up, was founded in 2017 with support from Global Education Network Europe, who are our main policymaker partners for our work. And we have now over a thousand members in all regions of the world. And one of the things that we try and do is, as well as organizing conferences and, and events, is particularly focusing on the work of early career researchers, because we think that's an important part of development of the work of the network. So the format of the event will be the three breakout groups related to three distinct themes. And then you'll also hear from uh, three of our early career researchers who are aiming to set up a special interest group within ANGEL aimed at early career researchers and what they're planning to do in taking um, the work forward. The theme A is on global citizenship education and policy development, which looks at policy growth in, in a range of contexts. The second one is particularly looking at global citizenship education in practice, looking at examples of, of research, particularly um, within the formal education se sector. And the third one is on education for sustainable development, looking particularly at research and practice, but also some policy issues and how education for sustainable development relates um, to some of the broader discussions we've been having in, in global education and learning. And one of the things particularly raised in that context is in making sure there are voices from the global south in some of those conversations. Well, I'll make a start. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for the introduction um, uh, as as well, Suzanne. Um, it is great sadness. Meake de Vries from University College was not able to attend. Um, she's currently working and she's on a, on a school trip, so she was not able to um be away so um, i'll have the pleasure uh to present this um on behalf of both of us so as as Suzanne said is reaching for global citizenship otherwise through imagining and living in transtemporal and spatial collaboration and <clears throat> in terms of the aims what i will try to do today um will address um as part of this sort of dimension the element of what the term global citizenship education can actually mean in different cultural and institutional contexts. So we'll try to aim to explore that strand as part of today's presentation. The way we're going to do that, uh, we are going to reflect on an autobiographical narrative of our common collaboration, Meaki and I, and we're going to apply a post-humanist lens. Um, and we're hoping to present our voice towards possibilities of global citizenship education otherwise. Kind request uh, for all of you, reminder probably, this is us openly sharing our own autobiographies. It's something really personal to us. And, and we're just coming into terms of exploring this new piece of research. We absolutely welcome feedback. So I'll try and summarize everything in a quick presentation, not open up to discussion. So we, we really kindly wish to hear your thoughts of how we explore um, this element as part of our work. Um, in line with autobiography and autobiographical research, it's really important to set the context in terms of those who are doing autobiography. And I'll describe really, really briefly how our collaboration with Meaki and I have started up and why we've decided to draw on that collaboration through autobiography to draw some data and start completing this personal piece of research. We've, we've known each other since the COVID pandemic, so it's three years. And we've met through a dark doctoral reading group back in 2020. I've never met Meaki face to face, but we've been working ongoingly for the last three years on an online basis. To give you a bit of context, I live in London, Meaki is in Amsterdam, so we haven't had the chance just yet to collaborate and meet face to face. All of this work through reading sessions, monthly meetings, writing sessions, collaborative activities, led to publication of a piece that we did back in 2020 and you can access that as well, um, which celebrate the work of Friere. And 
uh, that was published by Synergies, um, a teachers reflecting on teaching global issues because I'm also part of the problem. And we've taken a post-colonial lens to frame our approach to global citizenship education back in that paper as well. Now, what, how we're saying, uh, we're both completing a doctoral research currently. We're both at different stages. I'm completing corrections post viva. Meaki is analyzing her data currently, but we're both completing and using elements of action research in one way or another. Uh, Meaki's research is based in a secondary school in the Netherlands. My research, my case study with features of action research was based in a primary school in Greece. And the other common feature that we have that brought us together is that we both come from teaching backgrounds. Meaki is currently a secondary school teacher. I used to be a primary school teacher and I'm currently a lecturer at Brunel University London in teaching primary teacher education. So this is a bit of how we've come together and how um, our interests intertwined. Now, our purpose of works for the last three years is, is trying to aim to see what global citizenship education could be otherwise. And when we talk about global citizenship education otherwise, we mainly talk about Andre Otis' work, thinking about post-colonialism, decolonial approaches. And we all simply by Spivak, and, and we try to frame our approach. How can we challenge current epistemological and ontological perceptions of global citizenship education, which are based in the Enlightenment construct? I'm not going to go to explore that in great detail. Hopefully this gives you a bit of a context, how we frame and how theoretical interests have come together. So that's our main purpose in terms of our research and our positionality as researchers in the field of GSE. Now, specifically the aim of this research work I'm presenting to you today, we decided to reflect and, and think about autobiographies as part of this journey, just to be able to think, what's our conceptualization of GSE so far? So what have we achieved between of us working together for the last three years? And how can we do that at a deeper level? Now, we also thought how we're gonna achieve this. What's the way of actually reflecting on our own work and try to adopt a more critical and more deeper lens? The first thing we said is we accept that we're constructs of the enlightenment ourselves. Even if we, we try to strive for GSE otherwise, we do understand we're both members of the academic community. We both live in Amsterdam and London. So we're really made of that global north and we understand our positionality in the concert of the Enlightenment. So we said in order for us to be able to do that, we will need to adopt a lens of post-humanism. So we challenge completely that Enlightenment construct and we will way beyond that. And we thought, how are we gonna approach that post-humanist lens in our work? So, what we did to collect the data for what I'm going to present to you today, uh, beginning of April, we said, let each of us write a piece of writing to describe our common collaboration, our autobiographies, no longer than a page. Uh, and we didn't show that to each other. So we did that separately. So each of us recounted what our collaboration looks like after those three years. Now, to apply that posthumanist lens, having been inspired by uh, research from Cock from Calte in 2020, we use magical realism as a literary genre to write that autobiographical piece. And the reason for that is because we know what our collaboration was to try to move away from a colonial type of writing that follows academic standards. Applying a magical realism can be linked to the whole lens of posthumanism. I'm not going to go into great det det detail about that of this paper, happy to discuss that a bit more, but some of the features of using magical realism as a literary genre are the ones that you can see in the bullet points at the, at the end. So it's thinking about reversing the magical supernatural and ordinary, issues of borders mixing and change, hybridity in terms of writing, non-linear aspects of time, subjective sense of causality, carnivalesque type of writing, and a bit of ironic sense of distance. I'll show you some of these ideas of how, what our writings looked like. And you can see that obviously I've used a different approach than Meaki used, but you can see these features in the following example. So here's a brief snapshot of Meaki's autobiographical narrative. And I know she wanted me to share that obviously she's using an ironic type of writing in, in, in this piece of work. So um, have a brief look. You can see here what she's, she's talking about. I'm gonna pause for, for a second. And you don't need to go through all of that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you 
bit of a snapshot of my own piece of work. Again, I'll pause for a second. And hopefully this has given you a bit of an idea. I'm happy to come back to that if you have more questions about that. Just to say again, when we've written these pieces, none of us knew what approach each of us will take. We, we had a title, let's go and write another autobiography of our, of our collaboration, and let's use the features of, of magical realism to apply that posthumanist lens. Now, the first level of analysis, when we took that piece and started analysing it, and only one of us analysed those pieces, although we both read them separately, one of us analysed just to make sure that we're on one page, and that's probably something we can explore further of reanalyzing that from a different from a different point of view. So the first level of analysis descriptive, you can see that obviously Meaki has used the actual reality and has used our actual names as part of describing the autobiography. And the main dominant magical realism feature that she drew upon as part of that, it was issues of border mixing and change and that ironic sense of writing. And you can see an example of that, of how that irony comes through. Now I took a completely different approach. So you can see I've used an imaginary planet named Teach as my context. And my characters are not using ourselves as part of autobiography, but I'm using personified animals, albatross and bear in that case, um, and they're genderless characters. And the dominant magical realism feature I've used is reversing the magical, supernatural and ordinary. And you can see a quote from my piece just underneath. So that's the first level. When you look at those pieces descriptively, these are the things that jump out. Now, in terms of the second level of analysis, we've identified now some common themes. The main theme that comes from the level of the design that is common for both of us coming to this research is the explicit adoption of the posthumanist framework in order to acknowledge our role as part of the problem, our role as part of the Enlightenment construct. So that's came already before writing that piece. Now, when we analyze those pieces together, the main theme that both of us used, it was the main background of both stories. We both used the background of teaching as the main element to frame our stories. And you can see two quotes here. For example, Meaki's quote, there is one thing that we only express respect and appreciation for, and these are teachers. And my quote, I've placed my, my narrative in Planet Teach. So teaching really framed our understanding of framing that post-humanist GSC otherwise framework we're trying to apply. So what did this tell us from the first instance about GSC otherwise is that our voices as, as coming as emerging researchers towards challenging those current ontological and epistemological perspectives are positioned, are predominantly positioned in the reality of teachers. So we can only see our framework of GSC otherwise starting from that positionality of the teachers. Now, when we went for a third level of analysis, we've started identifying some common sub-themes. And you can see that was a really interesting activity to do because we both have the same sub-themes, issues of power and issues relating to the environment or sustainability. There's, there's a key difference there. But you will see here that the primary sub-theme in Meaka was the issues of power, whereas that was the secondary sub-theme for me and vice versa for sustainability and the environment. The environment was the primary sub-theme for me, and that was the secondary sub-theme for Miyake. Well, you can also see there, for example, the primary sub-theme is an explicit connotation, whereas the secondary sub-theme comes implicitly. And I'll give you an example. In the case, for example, of issues of power resisting to neoliberalism, Miyake has written here, give teachers a voice, because as teachers, we often feel voiceless ourselves. Now, in my case, I also resist neoliberalism, but I did that in a more subtle, in a more implicit way. For example, if you go in the second or something in my case, and I'm reading the quote here, it was a well-orchestrated act. Albatross and Bear used to the hypnotizing effect of any gathering, talking again about that um, element of teachers being used to a routine. So you can see how the different themes, the sub-themes, complete our understanding of GSE um, of GSC otherwise. Another interesting one, it was Meaki's resistance to notions of dominance, specifically masculinity, an explicit notion, and something I implicitly did my part by ex imp explicitly in that case, using genderless uh, characters as part of, of, my, of my work. And just trying to bring that to a conclusion. So what, what, what we try to do by doing that, this activity, it really helps us 
to conceptualize what does GSE otherwise mean for us as researchers by having applied this posthumanist lens. And for us, EGC otherwise, having reflected on that, is, is kicking off with what we saw in the top, is appreciation of teachers' lived experiences. And then we move around and we have the challenging ontological and epistemological ways of an enlightenment, resistance to notions of dominance, for instance, masculinity, and resistance to neoliberal realities, and concern about issues of sustainability in the environment. And I've got an asterisk there, just in case, because I talked about sustainability, whereas Merkel talked about the environment. So there was not complete um, agreement on that area, but again, we found that that was that was a similar area of expertise. So I'm not by no means I'm saying this is a conceptualization of VGC otherwise, and that's why we've given a title there. This is just the beginning of us understanding what GSC otherwise means for us through just a moment where we applied and we reflected on autobiographies for a posthumanist lens. And just to bring that into conclusion, what was, again, preliminary conclusion, so we will really welcome your feedback on this one. So thinking about the outcomes, in terms of us, it just allows us to create a better understanding for what GSE otherwise means for us and how we can go about understanding and achieving a GSE otherwise framework. Now, we also see that as early career scholars, this can also has outcomes for the wider teacher education community in global citizenship education, but again, to the wider global citizenship education debate, is, is appreciating and reflecting on the possibilities of coming together as researchers and working collaboratively on, on a long time scale. Obviously, this reflection here reflects on a collaboration of three years. And, and it made us think, what are the possibilities if more of us come together and create this space of collaborations? Within that, though, we say that is explicit, is, is really important that we explicitly acknowledge our role in the Enlightenment construct. And only by doing that, in our case, we've applied the post-humanist lens and used magical realism, we can start thinking um, to uh, and promote and hopefully achieve GSE otherwise as um, as a possibility for the future. And hopefully this is a summarizing some of the research we have been doing. And, and thank you very much all for your attention. Okay, so I'm, yeah, I'm doing my um, education doctorate at OIC in, at the University of Toronto in a um, program that is um, about policy, leader, policy um, and leadership. Uh, in education, so so my work is more on on a case study on policy change in Estonia. Um, I was thinking that in the in this presentation is it's sort of my my um, proposal for my research, but maybe it changed a little bit as I'm now sort of already in the data collection um, phase and I'm changing my my direction as I go along. But I, I just present to you my research questions and the design and the methods and, and the conceptual framework and maybe get some ideas from you how you, if you see that it's, it's sort of feasible and understandable. But first, maybe I think all the Global citizenship uh, research starts with the uh, with the definitions, um, and I in my research I'm looking at global citizenship education as sort of an umbrella term to different educational uh, approaches that aim as uh, and in transformative education uh, towards global citizenship and sustainability, um, and there are different typologies. I I'm at the moment collecting these these ideas that they are on the ground on the that different different actors in Estonia have. So I'm not completely sure what kind of typology I, I will be using in the end for the analysis, but it will be something around like looking at neoliberal and sort of soft and critical and and, and then this sort of um, post-critical or alternative uh, kind of um, understanding of um, of global citizenship or the planetary citizenship as 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 um, some people here also define it. So, so um, the official um, definition now used by the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs is the is the one adopted in Dublin uh, last year. So that's that's why it's also there, which is also like reflecting some of the sort of critical ideas um, on global citizenship education. Uh, and why Estonia? What is the relevance and justification for my research? Um, PCD has not been studied before. 
as someone mentioned. So it's interesting that we, we hear also from these, these countries. Um, and I think Estonia provides an interesting context. Uh, it has gone through a tremendous change during the last 30 years from being part of the Soviet Union and now being very sort of... Um, um, sort of model liberal democracy. Uh, and in the education field, Estonia is doing very well. It's sort of in the international comparisons, Estonia is sort of um, having the best educational outcomes in the PISA, PISA um, studies and and um, and also sort of a, a pioneer in digital education. So there are lots of things uh, uh, progressing in Estonia. At the same time, uh, some of the same studies show that maybe there is something to improve in the sort of the global solidarity aspect and being an active um, uh, citizen. Um, and, and my aim is sort of to understand policy change. And I hope my, my research will also contribute to that, uh, looking at the effectiveness of, of some of the advocacy tools and, and partnerships that are promoted in global citizenship education. Um, and also looking at some of the impacts of events um, in the, as I'm doing sort of a historical policy analysis, looking at the impact of COVID-19 or now the war in the Ukraine, which has had a huge impact in Estonia. Estonia has taken uh, some 50,000 Ukrainian refugees, which is the sort of per capita, the the, the largest number in, in Europe and, and is giving a lot of aid. And at the same time, Estonia has a big Russian minority and, and there are some tensions uh, that the war has, has brought uh, to that relationship. Um, and Estonia is a small country. Uh, it's informal, open, so it's it's quite feasible to re to research. And and I have my personal experience of working in this this uh, field for fifteen years, uh, running an NGO, working with teachers, teacher trainings, and and material development. So, so that makes it sort of feasible and and um, uh, interesting for me. And and why I chose this topic is also that I'm interested in this like policy diffusion of ideas about global solidarity and responsibility and how they have changed in time. And now we have these uh, big international um, tools and instruments like the SDG 4.7, we have the Dublin Declaration, uh, different global competence models, and, and then looking at how these are then uh, implemented and understood at the local level. Um, and in Estonia, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs developed their own like framework for, of global competencies. I was part in that, of that working group developing this, this model of what global citizenship or the global competencies or competencies for global citizenship mean in, in the Estonian context. So I'm now also interested in looking how this tool is used. Um, there's a curriculum reform going on at the moment. So, so how much influence these kind of tools uh, have in, in practice. Um, and my research questions in my is sort of in, in overall is, is how, how is global citizenship education becoming institutionalized in the Estonian formal education policy? And then looking, there's our questions looking at sort of this history of the concept in Estonia, um, what has been the role of international policies networks ideas in this development, um, what sort of current factors, networks and um, and ideas and both in internal and external support or challenge the institutionalization um, and what opportunities and challenges this new model um, of competencies would, would bring to this uh, policy development. Um, I have my research design is sort of based because it's a case studies, but it's sort of this looking at different flows of um, um, of ideas and, and cooperation in vertical level from the international organizations to the national level and then to the school level and then the horizontal sort of networks and cooperation and, and, and exchange of ideas between partners in the, in, in the horizontal level. But then I'm mainly interested in this sort of transversal um, looking at um, the development in, in across time. Um, it's a very uh, mixed picture, but it shows like how many different actors they are in, in, in policy development uh, in different levels. Um, what I'm mainly interested in is sort of looking at the, the um, relationship between ministries. Um, uh, the, um, the, there's two universities training teachers, so looking at those universities, how much they are involved. And then um, there's a new initiative, like the, the state is is at the moment establishing new um, gymnasiums like upper secondary schools. 
So two uh, new gymnasiums are taking global citizenship and ESD in its sort of very holistic um, understanding as their core core sort of specializations. So I'm looking at the these two uh, schools, their headmasters, the directors, also their sort of vision and, and how much they influence policy. And then there is an NGO that I used to work with, which is also very involved in, in supporting the ministry and supporting these schools. So I'm looking at these key actors in my, my research more in detail. Um, the research methods are mainly qualitative. Now, now I'm actually in the in the middle of doing policy document al analysis and, and collecting um, materials material from interviews and, and focus group discussions. Um, and my conceptual framework is based on this sort of idea of these different levels, the vertical, horizontal and transversal, but I'm mainly basing my sort of theoretical, sort of the, the conceptual framework on, on um, the full and triple I model of looking at policy change from initiation to implementation and then institutionalization. That's why I'm talking about this institutionalization because sort of following that, idea by full and, and then also these six accept, ac aspects that Heike Lang Kenny have um, identified as being the key in policy change which are sort of the events context ideas institutions actors and networks so I'm trying to look at those um, those uh, as I'm doing my data collection and, and analysis so I'm sort of doing my historical policy analysis, which is sort of looking at how this like concept of global citizenship education was um, was first established in the Estonian language and the understanding in like end of uh, 1990s when Estonia changed from being a recipient of aid after the transition um, to becoming a donor country because in 1998 it became a donor country as a prerequisite to be a EU member and NATO member. So, so it started sort of from that um, sort of Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Development Corporation field, uh, but it has sort of widened to to um, to also um, um, sort of comprise also the sort of the previous ESD uh, and human rights education and all those different education into one. Uh, and then there's the big implementation phase where it's mainly like NGOs working on projects, trying to get teachers um, involved, um, doing advocacy towards the ministries. And, and, and there are some signs also in the in the previous curriculum reform, there was an um, optional course uh, in, in, in included in the curriculum, which actually states the the concept of global citizenship education so it's it was already included in 19 uh, 2014 but in this present curriculum reform it's going to be hopefully um sort of strengthened and and explained and and in, in included in a bit more but at the same time um now in the in the phase that i would say is sort of institutionalization it's becoming more um like previously, it was only the NGOs, but now you can see that the ministries are getting involved. Uh, there was a gene peer review. Um, so the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Education together um, sort of invited Gene to do the peer review. So that was one one sort of part of, of becoming more interested in including global citizenship education in the policy. Um, then there was the, the new uh, agency for development cooperation that sort of was uh, instrumental in, in making this new competence framework and trying to push it to the curriculum. And then, as I explained, there are these new state gymnasiums uh, that are taking these initiatives as their sort of core principles. Um, but it seems like what is still sort of um, the weaker point is sort of the cooperation between ministries and the initial teacher training institutions. Um, so yeah, as I'm in the middle, so my my idea now is to do this historical policy analysis, um, and then maybe do like portraits of two four, of four, four key actors and sort of innovators and policy entrepreneur, entrepreneurs uh, who are sort of instrumental in this policy change. And those are the two um, state gymnasiums or their headmasters. Then the NGO that has been sort of instrumental in, in providing training and materials and, and advocacy work. And then the new um, agency for development cooperation, because they've really taken this initiative and been pushing it to towards the Ministry of um, Education that is still very hesitant. 
So um, yeah, so that's just the timeline. I'm hoping to get my uh, data collected now, do the analysis, come back to Estonia in, in autumn um, to do the validation and then start writing the dissertation. So I think that was all. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all. I'm a year two PhD student at the University of Manchester, and I'm currently an a visiting student in the Chen University of Hong Kong. I'm also in the uh, stage of collecting my data, but this research um, hasn't included my empirical data, only the policy, uh, policy analyze. So my research is about the relations between global citizenship education and internationalization of higher education in China. So um, this is my um, contents of this presentation. Uh, I will just escape the literature review. I guess this is the advantage for the last um, pre um, presenter because you are all um, already talked about the literature in GCE. So I will just go through my research objectives and methodology, also my initial findings and a little bit discussions and uh, conclusions. Um, I will just ex escape the literature review and then draw a little summary. Mm, but I guess we all agree that global citizenship is very hard to deliver in the classroom and, and to make our students know how and know why and also make social change. I guess that is the very, um, the most um, important things um, like, like we agree about the delivering global citizenship education. Um, global citizenship education in China is very different from other contexts because uh, we don't have um, a particularly a particular um, curriculum or education system to deliver global citizenship in higher education. It's not um, formerly existed in our classroom or our um, our education policy. Um, however, it is discreetly existed or implemented in the internationalization of higher education. I will go through um, internationalization policy and also strategies in the following slides. But my research objectives is um, on, uh, um, to identify how GCE is framed in Chinese higher education policy and also to analyze the working mechanism of education policy in the internationalization education as a political tool and its intended consequence and also to explore how higher education institutions create space for global citizenship education and the corresponding impacts. So even, um, and the methodology I adopt is for Gordian discourse analyze. Um, sorry. Uh, if you are not familiar with Gordian discourse analyze is um, a qualitative research approach building much of the foundation upon the writings and ideas of Michel Foucault. It's um, different from the traditional discourse analysis. It, uh, it is aimed to understand some broad political ideology and historic issues as they relate to power and knowledge through discourse. Um, it's also a uh, two ways of understanding of education policy, both from top down and bottom up as this research um, hasn't include, included the empirical data. So uh, mostly it's on a top down level to uh, analyze the governance of internationalization um, of higher education. Um, so this is my searching items for achieving these objectives. Um, the left side are the name of the education policy in China and the right side are the similar um, but also the global citizenship education and also some other similar ideas about global citizenship education in China. And um, mostly uh, in China, it's mainly talk about intercultural communication, intercultural competence, intercultural intelligence, global competence or cross, cross cultural communication. But later I will introduce how internationalization of higher education bring the education reform and, um, and the change of the higher education field to make it as 
to make it a complicated places that students experience both Western epistemologies and Eastern epistemologies. In this case, it gave it um, it inspires us or it inspires me to look at how Chinese students uh, reflect, uh, act, reflect, and interact with the internationalization initiatives. Um, here are some um, keywords or some words in that framed in the Chinese um, education policy, as I mentioned. Um, Fugodian discourse analysis is not just the textual analysis. I extracted these words um, in this slide is um, in order to show how the um, global citizenship is um, might be framed in the education policy, just a better understanding of the ideology in the Chinese education policy. Um, let me say that it. Uh, from these policies, you can say the interest in global citizenship education in internationalization is driven in part by policy initiatives from education departments in China, including national, provincial, and local authorities. And you can see a particular uptake of the term mutual cultural understanding and the embedding of a global dimension across subjects and documents. And you also can say like, um, in 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 all the in in the in education policies, and um, it um, doesn't use like um, global. It most mostly it use international to replace the connotation of global. And these policies displayed the attitudes and skills commonly called for in global and national discourses about global citizenship, such as global consciousness cultural understanding, human-to-human -human exchange, and cultural awareness. Uh, that's why even though global citizenship education is not appeared in formal education policy or our curriculum, there is still space to explore global citizenship education in China because this, this kind of work, this kind of discourse exists in our education policy and it also influences the practical approaches. And these are the practical approaches in the internationalization of higher education. I recognize that these approaches create space for students developing their global citizenship. Just in short, students experience this global citizenship by um, experience the epistemology both from Western, um, Western side and also the Chinese um, classroom. So you can say it, um, let me see my screen. So these approaches bring question about how it changes the space in the higher education field in terms of students' experience. Then these are the overall, um, how to say, the overall aims of why Chinese government promote internationalization of higher education, mostly in past four decades. After the opening of the country, but also the opening up of the education is just 40 years, but it promotes internationalization of higher education in all kinds of ways in the higher education field, as I already showed you the all practical approaches in the previous slide. So it is aimed to open up our education, but also increase institutions, global, intercultural and international dimensions. And it is aimed to build world-class universities and it also aim to introduce overseas uh, resources. It promotes uh, mobility of both students and um, faculty members. That's why you can see many, many Chinese students um, experience overseas education and also uh, faculty members go to the uh, Western University, mostly at US, UK or Australia, some um, English speaking countries to have their um, partnership. But these are all um, this um, aim are all only lo loca located at the, um, how, the, how to say, the, um, the governance level to, um, how to say, to, like, uh, to achieve its internationalization of higher education. For me, when I look, look at the global citizenship education in, in Chinese students, I want to say how um, these approaches uh, as a result make changes in the um, 
in the school field, in the campus, uh, what kind of changes directly influence students' experience in when they get their higher education in a Chinese university. So let me find my... We can conclude that, that students mainly experience internationalization at home and internationalization at abroad. In the internationalization at home, students experience international, internationalized curriculum. So while building new international courses, and Chinese universities need to integrate global knowledge and international perspectives into existing courses to truly realize the internationalization of the curriculum. That's why it brings the reform of pedagogy and also innovative assessment that both involve the, how to say, the, the pedagogy or the, um, the way of the assessment from the Western university. That's one of the way of, achieve or realize the internationalized um, curriculum. And also students are aware of and also engaged with global issues and phenomena in this internationalized curriculum. There are also- I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, we got the information mm -hmm. that this will be closed within four minutes sharp. So maybe you focus yeah. on the most- I only have two slides. Okay, that's yeah, fine. I only have two slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I then and there is another um, uh, another phenomenon is that uh, the promotion of study in China it means Chinese university also uh, encourage or recruit overseas students from all over the world so that also brings the change of the field in the classroom that, that's why we need to say what happened inside the classroom and also outside the classroom and also Chinese students make friendship with overseas students in the Chinese campus. And in the internationalization at abroad, it mainly re re reflects on jointly study abroad program. The findings from Chinese policy suggest that the per, um, Chinese, inter Chinese students are also framed in terms of cultural enrichment and intercultural competence in internationalization. The concept of third place offers a solution to look at how students might reflect on their global citizenship in their social life. And um, Kun Dai, uh, in, 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 in his research on students' experience in study abroad, he recognized that students as in-betweeners and they're familiar with uh, uh, learning or learn, uh, how to say the education system, both um, from home university and also host university. But in practice, there is little evidence that this benefit is in fact being realized because um, there is little attention on how far the true or commitment of the university responded responded to these goals. So it really need to look at like look it at case by case to how to say how this university adopts internationalization approaches to make the change of their um, higher education field. Um, that's why the this research also need to embody the empirical data further to make a more concrete findings. And after analyzing the education policy and understanding how internationalization at home and at abroad might create space for developing students' global citizenship, I have these findings. I will not draw on them, but just a, a brief summary that um, you can see the instrumentalism of internationalization practice is required ongoing contributions to critical reflections. And this research is not yet completed. I just share my findings from um, policy analysis and the literature review. My next step, my next step is combining student study journals to achieve the objectives from bottom up level. Uh, Thank you for your, that's some key reference from my research and thank you for your listening. Thank you. Um, and just to say that my two colleagues are joining me today. So uh, Gemma, um, Jemima Davey uh, is in the audience. So if you can give a wave Jemima and Gemma Cass Toom. Um, so at St Mary's University, uh, we decided to collaborate on a research project looking at critical global citizenship education to challenge subject disciplines. So we've started with science education as a more obvious one, but we think that our work will then transcend to other disciplinary areas. Um, so here are our, our main aims. Uh, firstly, we wanted to work with teachers. So really ensuring that it was collaborative from all areas, um, looking at 
a unique school ethos and values and attributes and how perhaps those ethoses can actually be nurtured through subject disciplines. And in England, which is where we lecture um, as teacher educators, that we still have a system which is predominantly knowledge based and very much siloed in individual subjects. So we wanted to make sure that that we could see some sort of translation there. Uh, and we thought that perhaps global citizenship uh, education could provide a very good lens for creating a greater cohesion. The second aim was looking at the disconnect um, and gaps between a school's unique ethos and subject discipline and considering how GC uh, pedagogies could be used as a bridge. And thirdly, we wanted to ensure that we were taking on board and we were, were collaborating with expert practitioners or teachers to explore how these GC uh, pedagogies can um, be used within schools and looking at some of the, the challenges along the way. So those aims were then um, distilled into some research questions. Uh, the first one being looking at how the pedagogies of global citizenship education could be used within an individual discipline, in this case, primary science education in England. We wanted to look at the challenges and issues of implementation, and we wanted to support a variety of teachers in a variety of settings. And of course, looking at the impacts of the implementation of the approach um, with our collaborative team. So the first uh, stage or uh, the first phase of our project involved an online survey before we met with our team. Um, and that really enabled the, the, the teachers that we worked with to uh, identify what their school values and ethos were, to allow them to really think about what they understood to be global citizenship education before they came to our workshops, uh, and then looking at their understanding of the purpose of primary science education. Um, we then brought six teachers uh, to our university to conduct intensive workshops, um, which was just brilliant because we had an opportunity to really have the space and time to work together as a team, uh, refining pedagogical principles and refining our understanding of global citizenship education. Um, and, and a framework for delivery. We then worked with academic partners, which of course are Jemima Davy and Gemma Cass, who are with me today to refine uh, the, the, the framework. And then we'll go back and have a look at it further. Now, it was important that we looked at various lines of, of our research methodology wanted it to be very participatory. Uh, so we wanted to ensure that the teachers and of course ourselves um, took a critical reflect reflective practice uh, method or approach. So everything was uh, iterative and, and evolving along route. So firstly, we wanted our teachers to develop a critical knowledge and understanding of global citizenship education, um, really unpicking what that meant from a critical perspective. Secondly, we wanted our teachers to critically analyse their own assumptions, values and practices, not just of global citizenship education, but also of um, science education as a subject discipline, which was really important for us. And then finally, the most important strand of this phase, the first phase of our research, was to ensure that our teachers engaged in autonomous, intentional action and practice. So making sure that they were really reflecting on how they could embed um, the global citizenship framework in their perspective. So very much deliberate rather than random uh, and reactive. Um, now, of course, the, the first part of our workshops really involved unpicking our understanding, both as teacher educators and teachers, of what global citizenship education meant. So we took lots of different views, lots of different papers, and really started to unpick. And for us as a team, a team of six teachers and three um, teacher educators, uh, we took on board San Tetal's view of ensuring that it was all to do with um, participating for the common good and that that um, layer of social justice. 
We looked at UNESCO's definitions, making sure that we understood it not as a, a, a list of things to do, uh, but an approach to education and subsequently an approach to life. Um, we looked at uh, Valencia, Sabata and Fernandez, definition, looking at different perspectives, um, being part of and acting for the good of common uh, global community. We looked at the, um, the uh, soccer uh, GACA um, values education, so looking at that responsibility to affect positive change. And finally, we looked at um, uh, Sharma's value creating GCSE, which, or, which made us really think about the importance of respect. Um, but what we wanted to do within our research was we wanted to try really hard to look at the interfaces of the experiences within our team. So um, Gemma Cass, who is with us, she's worked in several international uh, education systems. And so she brought in um, her perspectives. And Gemma, if you'd be happy to just share for a minute your perspective that you added into our conversation. Yeah, yeah thank you, Amy. So um... Predominantly, my experience has been working um, in IB schools, which a number of you might be familiar with in terms of their um, framework for international education. Um, one thing really at the heart of, of what they talk about is um, what they call international mindedness. Um, obviously, we're talking about glo global citizenship and we can see that overlap there. And sort of the, the key things that um, I would say permeate throughout everything that they're, they're trying to do within this framework and, and for children and schools to experience is that global engagement, um, which if we think back to those definitions that Amy um, shared as well is included in that. So that idea of um, opportunities to understand different communities, different cultures, and really um, see opportunities beyond um, sort of their local environment um, also that intercultural understanding as well similarities differences between others um, and I think a lot of what we've talked about and what we've sort of gained from looking at our experiences within international education it's about the community that you're with so although it's understanding those greater um, global opportunities and um you know, experiences that that children might have available to them in the future. But it's it's about understanding who they are right now, what they're already bringing to their school communities, um, how the children can learn ab about, you know, um, the world from each other, from what each other are bringing to bring into the classroom. Um, and then once you've, you know, you're developing that confidence and that respect and the empathy, again, some of those words that, that are familiar to, to those um, um, examples that Amy shared, you know, then it's sort of looking beyond that as well. So it's really starting with that community that you've got and embracing it further. The one area you can see um, just based on this model from the IB that we haven't looked at is the multilingualism. Obviously, that would be another aspect as well. But those two, that global engagement and the intercultural understanding was sort of key in terms of supporting the research that we had done um, and then sort of thinking about the communities that we'll be working with and the schools that we will be working with. Thank you so much Gemma. So in terms of analysing the first part of our research, the surveys, uh, we looked at each of the individual school um, ethos and values and we picked out the key components. Then we um, compared those key uh, words from their ethos to the global citizenship, citizenship attributes that we had um, collaboratively decided were important. Uh, and then what we did was we looked at the attributes that teachers thought could be nurtured through the discipline of science education. And what we identified that there was a real cohesion between school ethos um, and our agreed global citizenship attributes, uh, such as happiness, thoughtfulness, compassion, respect, uh, but they didn't then translate into science education. So our framework then really um, decided to focus in how could we ensure that some of these important attributes that weren't necessarily related to the neoliberal um, aspects of, of, of some interpretations of global citizenship, but this is more about um, children's community and, and their bit sense of belonging. Um, so this was our initial framework. Amy. Two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so our initial framework had four elements, and I'm going to race through this at the speed of light. The first part was uh, connection and compassion. Um, so really looking at uh, a social justice approach of allowing uh, our um, our teachers to draw upon children's backgrounds, children's nationalities, children's cultures as a starting point for science learning. And of course, that space to enjoy each other uh, as understanding and learning. So the, the, we looked at the eco capabilities as well. So an example was looking at the flowers uh, that children loved from their nationalities and backgrounds. The second strand was the systems thinking approach, so taking the concepts of a subject discipline like science and helping children to see the connections, not only to other concepts, but to bigger global issues. So we use the sustainable development, uh, um, the sustainable development goals as a framework. Then the third aspect was really to look at, uh, in science specifically, the importance of inquiry and children having the agency to find out answers to their own questions, but more more purposeful questions rather than just inquiry for the sake of inquiry. And then final, finally, the, 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 um, the part that our colleague Jemima um, was um, our, our header on was this idea of um, ensuring that we could connect science to other subject areas so that instead of being siloed, it was connected in a purposeful way, so in an, uh, using an interdisciplinary approach. So our next steps of our research uh, really look at um, then bringing our teachers back to conduct further um, uh, workshops where we will conduct semi-structured interviews with the participating teachers to look at the, um, the challenges, but also the impacts of using our framework uh, and then focus group discussions with our academic partners to see how we can perhaps um, use this approach within teacher education to ensure that teachers have a better understanding of global citizenship education, not as a bolt on, but as part as e part of every subject area they, they teach through uh, a nation's curriculum, uh, and that will help us to answer uh, our research questions. So I've popped on some um, of our all of our references there at the end that have supported our research, uh, and of course we, we're happy to share our um, uh, slides with you and then answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you, everybody, and, and thank you, Amy, and your team um, for introducing so many of the concepts that I'm going to touch on as well, um, but from a different perspective. So um, my study uh, focused on young alumni that had uh, short-term international immersive learning experiences when they were in high school, um, and I will... Um, this is my research question. So it's really trying to understand any possible influence of um, a immersive international learning experience that was short term that participants had when they were adolescents um, and trying to think about how that impacted them over time. So as many of you know, um, there has been quite a bit of emphasis on student mobility, on short-term exchange programs or immersion programs that are organized and supported by schools, by secondary schools. Um, but most of the research looks at immediately pre and post experience or even during the experience. And so this um, study really looked at um, any possible impact on them um, five to eight years after they had that experience. Um, and so you can kind of see um, and some of the framing comes from sort of um, global competencies, but also um, you know, looking at these specific skills, intercultural communication, perspective taking and behavioral adaptability. Um, but in, in terms of the theoretical framing of this study, you know, quite a few different influences with the focus on relational global competence, um, looking at intercultural development theory, um, as well as a, a lot of adolescent development psychology. Um, so this, the methodology, you know, was a mixed method study, um, the quantitative study, uh, really looking at self-reported behavior frequency, 
uh, as well as a number of other factors, but that was sort of the main one. Uh, and then any connection to that current behavior frequency to the previous experience in adolescence. And then the, the um, there was a sort of bridging part to the methodology to sort of connect participants back to that experience that happened five to eight years prior and the quali qualitative interviews or semi-structured interviews. The participants all, uh, you know, came from six different independent schools in North America and U.S. and Canada that had these long-standing international programs that were organized by the school. They were five, they participated in the program five to eight years ago at time of participation. These programs were short term. There is some research on, on um, adolescents who engage in a half a year, a whole year immersion. But I was really looking at uh, do these short term programs have, make any difference. And then uh, they took place out in a country outside of the country where the school is located. And they provided some opportunity for intercultural relationship building. Um, so in the in the quantitative study, there are 191 uh, participants and then um, 20 in the qualitative part. Uh, the qualitative interview participants did also participate in the quantitative survey, all of the quantitative survey participants were offered the opportunity for an hour long interview. Um, and 20 said, well, more than 20 said yes, but 20 actually showed up. So um, you can see the sort of average age was 24, 25. Um, and then the demographics of the uh, participants matched um, the demographics of, of the sample from the different schools. Two of the schools um, described themselves as girls' schools which accounts for the higher rate of participants identifying as female. So two things that really um, rose quickly to the surface uh, was this concept of adolescent neuroplasticity, um, this idea that um, at the time in adolescence, their uh, brain development was significantly impacted by a short-term experience because um, what, what was happening um, in the neurodevelopment. Uh, and so this, you know, this is a, a, a quotation from a participant, but there was a lot of emphasis on that this time at their in their life would mattered significantly to them in sort of helping to understand why such a, a short, relatively short experience continue to have an influence on them of their own interpretation. They also emphasize that they re interpreted the experience over time so that their understanding of that experience and its influence on them continue to evolve, continue to surface at significant times in their life. Um, and, and that that's something, you know, almost all of the participants indicated that what they would have said when they were 16 or 17 about that, that um, in experience, that learning experience was significantly different five to eight years later. Um, and you can see, you know, participants saying this common pattern of I didn't even really realize or I couldn't articulate um, and, until much later, partly because of their, um, you know, maturing as they as they grew. Um, so I'm going to skip this part. We'll get to that at the end. Um, but, you know, in terms of looking at intercultural communication, perspective taking and behavioral adaptability, these are sort of the three um, top ways that they described this experience. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of see, of course, this is self-reported, but, you know, this study is really looking at how participants understand and interpret their experience for themselves. Um, and so, you know, they're really um, indicating that these this experience helped them with the skill development. So the findings related to those three global competencies uh, were, were pretty interesting and the patterns were pretty consistent across participants. I would say one of the things that was most prominent was the relational learning as a really key factor that when they were able to develop significant relationship with a peer, with a host family, 
with a teacher that as part of their intercultural immersion, they reported much more significant influence, self-reported much more significant influence, which, you know, is not necessarily news to us that have been engaged in this work or supporting educators in this work, but it is, I think, um, especially relevant at this time when, um, you know, those kinds of practices have not been happening um, due to the COVID pandemic and that that opportunity for relationship building really is a difference maker. Um, relationship building, they also um, mentioned provided meaningful context for critical self-reflection. So it sort of um, pushed them into natural sort of critical self-reflection or comparison or understanding the self in context and relationship to others. Um, language learning um, as a key part of intercultural communication and perspective taking came up um, at, uh, repeatedly, as, the, as did listening as a skill that was repeatedly discussed as something that they learned through this experience, which, you know, many of us who have I've spent 20 years working with adolescents, it's not always something that comes up as they're mentioning as their top learning takeaway. Um, and then, you know, there was some um, kind of behavioral adaptability at the time of the study 2020 to 2022. You know, there was quite a lot of uh, conversations about how they drew on this, their experience when they were in high school to manage the pandemic, to navigate ambiguity, to, um, you know, understand their experience in connection, in, in contrast to other people's experience of the pandemic around the world. Um, and one factor that repeatedly came up during the qualitative research was around identity development and how this experience significantly contributed in, in their view um, to their own identity development, especially at a time when that was not necessarily part of the conversation or part of the intentional learning outcomes of the program design, you know, say now eight to 10 years ago. Um, but that, that, that experience helped them to sort of understand their own identity, their own racial identity, their own ethnic, linguistic, cultural identity, and has helped them sort of navigate a lot of the conversations that they engaged in in university or in, in their early careers. Two minutes, Claire. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, you can see just a little bit, a little bit more. I think one of the other things <clears throat> is that participants really talked about how that experience um, created for them or built in them a disposition for global and intercultural engagement over time so that they continued to engage, they continued to um, seek out intercultural engagement. Um, and this was especially true and statistically um, significant difference between participants of color in the study and white participants, which, you know, at least in North America, um, white participants in higher education um, study abroad, as it's called in North America, um, is, is, is much more disproportionately uh, white in North America has been for years and years. And in this study, um, you know, uh, participants of color were statistically uh, more likely to study abroad in higher education. So just sort of thinking about that early adolescence, that identity development, and sort of um, feeling comfortable in the space led participants to seek out further intercultural and international experiences later. Um, you know, I think one of the most common repeated um, phrases was this idea of sort of seeking out and trying to understand and listen across difference, um, as well as this idea of um, working to or learning how to be comfortable with uncomfortableness. And many of them talked about their um, repeated behavior in this area or their repeated disposition or skill practice in this area as beginning with that experience in adolescence, but now significantly, you know, meaningful to them, especially in contrast to their peers in their in their early 20s. Um, there were two um, limitations and sort of end with this. Um, but there, you know, participants who self-identified as transnational or having an immigrant identity reported limited impact of competence development. So they reported that they learned a little bit about themselves, that they had a good time, 
um, but that they didn't really develop many intercultural skills, primarily because the programs that they participated in were not differentiated for them. So they, they had an advanced set of intercultural skills going into the program, and the program did not meet them where they were as really designed with sort of a basic entry level, um, you know, intercultural skill set. Um, and then the, the second part was uh, participants who um, engaged in programs that had an explicit focus on community service or on volunteering um, really changed how they saw those programs over time. So most of them reported that they um, at the time, they thought it was a meaningful experience, that they learned a lot, that they gained a lot. Um, but as they matured and as they engaged with others, as they engaged in learning, um, that they really, you know, came to sort of a critical self-reflection and that they really questioned the purpose the, um, and, and the integrity of those kinds of experiences, many sort of seeing them now as perpetuating neo-colonial mindsets. And so that was a, a shift, right, in terms of looking at the long, young alumni. Um, so those are some, you know, qualitative um, results um, from that aspect of it. So, you know, I, this diagram sort of shows in blue the global competence development and, and the specific skills that were articulated by participants as and in the in the gray, um, the self uh, concept and identity development and sort of dispositions, right? So they're related to the internal or individual aspects. Um, and again, sort of the relational global learning as the sort of uh, common factor or key indicator of the possibility of these uh, learning outcomes as self-reported by young alumni. Thank you very much. And um, hi, everybody. So my name is Rita Dibeki, and I teach at Utrecht Lorient University in Budapest, Hungary, as a teacher trainer and also as a language teacher. And yes, just as Lasselet mentioned, um, uh, this is actually going to be part of my uh, my PhD uh, thesis uh, that I've just defended. So. Um, OK, so first of all, uh, the aims of my study. Uh, as you can see, the main aim was to explore secondary school English as a foreign language teachers' views and practices regarding global competence development in EFA classes in Hungary. Um, first, let me just very, very quickly walk you through the background of my study, then the research design. I'm going to talk about the results in more detail, and then I'm also going to outline some uh, conclusions and implications at the end. So first, about the background. Um, well, in the past years, I was interested in how we can nurture global citizens in the English as a foreign language classroom, so students who will be able to contribute to a better world. And to guide my inquiries, I actually used the OECD PISA's Global Competence Framework, um, the definition of which you can see the, on the slide. And well, I had two reasons for using this framework. One of them is that when I started my PhD studies, that was the time when it came out. I know that's the less um, elegant reason for it. But the other one is that even here in Hungary, there is uh, not too much debate about like the, the necessity to nurture or, or develop students' overall competences. So this, um, this framework didn't seem to be too controversial to, to have studies on. All right, so um, let me just talk about then the situation of global citizenship education in Hungary. Um, well, to tell you the truth, the idea, so the, the situation is far from ideal. So uh, given that we are also part of the United Nations, Hungary has also committed to the inclusion of uh, global citizenship education on all levels of the Hungarian educational system, but not much has happened ever since then. And if we look at the policy documents, then I would also say that maybe the situation seems to be even worse. So the 2012 version of the national core curriculum at least already contained some key development tasks and these key development tasks partly um, contain the global dimension as well. However, in the, um, the latest version of the national core curriculum, um, 
references to critical thinking, democratic participation, active citizenship, and individual responsibility appear way less markedly as well. And actually, the problem is quite visible as well, because uh, sociological studies show that Hungarian students seem to be quite apathetic, disillusioned with politics, and they do not participate in public affairs either. And they partly blame their education for this because they think that they were not prepared to do that in school. And uh, results of the 2018 piece of study also corroborate these findings because um, um, Hungarian 15 year olds scored low in examining issues of local, global, and intercultural significance and significantly lower than the OECD average when it came to their attitudes towards immigrants and also um, their agency regarding global issues. And uh, just to make matters even worse, there are also few references to the necessity to nurture global citizens in the training and outcome requirements of teacher training. So in this context, I was interested in seeing what teachers actually think about uh, global citizenship education and global competence development, um, and also what they do in practice. So let's move on to the research design. Here you can see my research questions. So as you can see, I was interested in the following things. What are the views of secondary school EFL teachers in Hungary on developing students' global competence? And I also had two sub-questions. Um, and the second main research question was, how do secondary school EFL teachers develop the knowledge dimension of global competence in their students? Uh, but later, um, I'm going to um, say why I was only concentrating on the knowledge dimension here. So I took the mixed methods approach uh, to achieve a fuller understanding of the research problem. In the first phase, I conducted an interview study with 10 secondary school EFL teachers from all around Hungary. Um, from coming from different school types and also representing different age groups. So I was aiming for a uh, maximum variation. And the findings from these uh, semi-structured interviews actually helped me construct my questionnaire for the online questionnaire study. Um, the online questionnaire reached approximately five thousand uh, secondary school EFL teachers. However, as you can see, there was quite a low response sorry, quite a low response rate because only 182 secondary school teachers took the time to fill it in. Nevertheless, I was quite satisfied with the sample because um, it made uh, comparisons based on school type, age groups, and settlement type uh, possible. So moving on to the results, as you can see, uh, first I was interested in um, secondary teachers' views on developing students' global competence. And what I found is that they actually find it important for their students to become global citizens. And they also think that it's important to raise global citizens in English classes. And um, they also think that it's part of their task to do that. And as EFL teachers, they also think that they have an easier task than, for example, their um, science, uh, their colleagues teaching science subjects would have, given that they think that uh, the EFL curriculum is way less fixed than the curriculum in other subjects. Um, then I also asked them about global competence and whether they could um, enumerate the different components of global competence and what sort of understanding they have of it. And what I found is that they, they have a varied understanding of uh, global competence. They failed to mention important components like uh, being able to reason uh, based on information, uh, adaptivity, perspective taking, and so on. They didn't mention these. Um, but mostly when I asked them about global competence, the, the component that they struggled most with was the knowledge dimension. So what knowledge does a global citizen actually need? Okay, and um, even though they couldn't fully describe global competence, um, I found that they still use various student-centered techniques in order to develop it. And uh, However, they do not incorporate the extramural dimension of, of global citizenship education in their lessons, nor do they use any transformative pedagogies like storytelling um, or service learning or project work. Um, next on, so 
given that based on the different empirical studies that I was acquainted with, one of teachers' main concerns about global citizenship education or global competence development may be dealing with sensitive and controversial issues. The, the aim of the second research question was actually to, to gain insight into the way secondary affairs teachers uh, develop the knowledge dimension uh, of global citizenship education in their students, so what topics they choose for classroom discussion, what attitudes they have, and also what are the different factors that influence them in bringing in such topics into their classes. So in my questionnaire, I, I uh, listed a few topics for them and they had to rate them based on how likely they would be to bring them into a class discussion. And what I found was that they, even though they deal with a variety of global and intercultural issues, they tend to avoid local issues and they do not like talking about global is uh, uh, local issues. Uh, mostly if they deem them controversial or if they think that they have political overtones. Um, in this table, you can see um, teachers, uh, so the topics that they would be most likely to deal with and the topics that they would be most unlikely to deal with. And I would like to draw your attention to the to the to that topic that uh, teachers, Hungarian teachers would be less likely to bring in, into their classes. And I think that this may not be a surprise in light of some recent developments in Hungary, namely the anti-LGBTQ propaganda law that was introduced in the previous year in Hungary. And I also brought you two quotes that I think perfectly capture uh, like teachers' hesitance uh, about uh, dealing with such topics and what topics they also consider to be taboos, namely politics and also the LGBTQ topic, and they don't deal with it because they think that they would be accused of brainwashing the students, which is, I think, very, very sad. Okay, um, moving Rita, on. Rita, yes. two more minutes. Okay. All right. Okay. Moving on to the other results, um, I also found that the type of school, the settlement type and the old age also influence teachers in their topic choice. So teachers from technical and vocational schools and teachers teaching in smaller towns are highly likely to avoid hot button topics for Hungarian society. But maybe some good news as well, the teachers on the 35 are more likely to include controversial issues in their classes. And interestingly, not only are younger teachers more likely to integrate these issues, but they also have more positive attitudes towards them, which also manifests in how frequently they involve them and the importance they attribute to these topics. And I also, I was also interested in what influences them in bringing in such content to their classes. And I found that it's teachers' own, comp own competence, students' interest, the availability of the materials and the time to prepare for their lessons. So um, let me conclude. Um, so I found that teachers have varied levels of understanding of global competence. So um, it would be important to develop their understanding of it uh, by integrating it into teacher training programs more markedly. It could also be part of the uh, training and outcome requirements. And in order to help uh, in-service teachers as well, it would be highly beneficial to provide them with continuous professional development opportunities that are affordable and that not only take place in Budapest, but also in the countryside as well. I also found that they tend to avoid local issues. So um, maybe part of the remedy could be to provide uh, trainees with positive models for with, of the uh, integration of both global and intercultural issues and local issues as well. And teacher trainees foundation courses at universities could uh, concentrate on this as well. And finally, I think it's quite interesting and um, other empirical studies also pointed at this is that teachers competence is very, very important in, in bringing in global content to their classes. But it's not just whether they are actually competent in doing that, but whether they feel that they are competent, that they are comfortable with dealing with such topics. So EFL teaching method methodology courses should help trainees um, prepare for this. Uh, they, it should, they should help, um, for example, trainees in preparing lesson plans, 
um, based on global, local and intercultural issues, materials creation, but also I think most importantly, it should help them in, um, in creating inclusive safe spaces for brave discussions. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I hope that we still have like two minutes to mm -hmm. discuss. Um, again, thanks everyone for coming to the uh, to my presentation. I'm Yue Miao Ma. I'm currently a third year PhD student, but I'm still in the middle of my data collection. So I'm still in a research field in, in China. So today my presentation will just be some uh, provisional findings and thoughts. And I would really like to hear your uh, feedbacks and perspectives. So to begin with, what is Model United Nations? Maybe some of you have heard of this term, or maybe you have Model UN experiences yourself. Well, uh, Model UN is a simulation activity of the real United Nations, and it is usually aimed at young people or students who are interested in international politics. So in this Model UN conference, they will play the roles of diplomats of different countries um, trying to solve some international issues. And I was first uh, exposed to Model UN when I was uh, in my secondary school and then also during my undergraduate study. And after that, I came to Edinburgh to do my postgraduate study. And also I did a little piece of research on Model UN in relation to local education policy in, in Scotland. And that was actually the first time I was exposed to the idea called global citizenship. Because here, I think global citizenship, you know, Model UN is considered as a GCE uh, program. But back in China, I never heard of this term. So I began to wonder why. Is it because the notion of global citizenship has been transformed or adapted to other concepts? So that is the beginning of my research. I want to investigate into this, which I think is socially constructed discourse, global citizenship, but also with a link to Model UN to this education program. So that's my first research question. What discourses of global citizenship are embedded in Model UN in China? Um, but then I want to go beyond that. I want to know about students' perspectives. So how do students respond to or negotiate these discourses? I think this question is partly in response to my own struggles when I was a Model UN participant when I was young. So I really want to know how today's young people are looking at Model UN and, and also how they construct global citizenship. And um, now I don't think I need to explain these frameworks because uh, I'm sure everyone here is so familiar with different approaches. But I want to talk a bit about how GCE can be impl implemented in Model UN. So it's described in literature that um, Model UN can broaden students' knowledge in international relations, geopolitical science, because they will be representing different countries or organizations in this activity. So they need to research on that perspective and uh, trying to solve issues on, on a particular perspective. And also they, can, they may enhance skills, including public speaking, because they need to lobby their country's interests. And they also need to write some documents, which are in the official form of the UN documents. And also they might develop awareness and contribution to social justice. That's because they're talking about international issues like climate change, security issues. So they might have, have an aim to build a, a better world. So you can see Model UN activity is really a multi-level and interdisciplinary activity. Um, but I think we still need to critically look at these so-called benefits. And I'll talk about some of these later on. Now, building on this literature, um, there's a research gap because this literature all comes from English speaking context. And there really lacks empirical research of GCE practices and of course, Model UN in China because Model UN activities um, has happened in China since the 1990s, but there hasn't been really a lot of research on it. So I'm trying to fill this uh, research gap. Um, in terms of methodology, uh, I'm taking, I'm doing an ethnographic case study of a Model UN club at a secondary school. So I think my research takes characteristics of both an ethnography and a case study, because I'm hoping to provide a complete description 
of this group of people I chose, which is the, the club. And the club will uh, include not only students, teachers, um, but also some general staff, like teaching assistants, and also maybe parents as well. And the methods of this research include critical discourse analysis. This has done before my field work. So I look at some um, newspaper articles and also school documents, just trying to know what these courses are there and to know more about the context, um, especially for the school. And recently I've been doing participant observation of the club activities and interviews and also funerals and, and journals. Now, before going to the uh, research findings, I think there are some contacts that I need to explain um, of the school and also of the club. So this school is located in a second tier city in China. And by second tier, I mean the city is not, not quite developed in, in terms of economy. Um, however, the school, this particular school, is one of the most prestigious middle school locally, or we call it an, a key middle school. So there's a, a system called key school system in China, which was established in the 1980s. The main criteria to define a city, uh, no, a, a school is key or not, is just their academic performances, so uh, exam scores. So you can imagine the sample of my uh, research participants, they are really good at studying. And for uh, the age of participants uh, between 13 and 15, uh, between grade seven to grade nine, and this club currently has around 80 members. And um, it might seem a good number, um, 80, 80 students here, but um, if we compare this to the, the total number of students in the school, so there are nearly 5,000 students in the school. So it's a really large school and uh, 80 out of 5,000 has access to this club. So you can imagine it's really, there's a selection process in it and it's really competitive to get into the uh, society. So let's come to the findings. Uh, the first one is about curriculum and pedagogy. So what is taught in this club and how, how is it taught? So there are three main activities in the club, which are training sessions, simulation sessions, and advanced seminars. And to be honest, except for the simulation sessions, the other two kind of activities doesn't have too much student engagement. So it's mainly lecture style, and the teacher is the uh, one who is talking uh, the most, and there are very few opportunities for interaction not only between teachers and students, but also among students. So there are rare, very rare group activities or pair uh, discussion. And even in a, in a session that is teaching uh, public speaking skills, there are very rare opportunities for students to practice public speaking. And there's another element of GC that we often talk about, which is critical thinking, but I think I might skip this part. Um, so the next finding is about access to education. So as I said, it's really, uh, the school is a key school in the area and it's really competitive, not only to get enrolled to the school, but also to get into the society. So to get into the school, um, currently the measures include uh, what is called this school district housing. So the city is divided into different districts and the students living in this particular street can go into the school. And because the school is a key school, and so parents want their kids to go to that school, which makes the housing prices in this area rise up like very high. So it's really, it's like several times more expensive than ordinary housing. So there's a bit of element of um, transformation between uh, economic capital and cultural capital. And also students might need to take interviews to get into the society. And also, um, I, don't have, I don't think I have too much time left. Maybe I'll move on to the third finding. Thank um, you. So, yeah, um, I think, so maybe we can uh, come to a, a bit of conclusion at this time. So if, whether we can make model year more accessible for everyone, but this comes to my ongoing concern about the power dynamics within Model UN 
So the nature of it, is it competitive, is it cooperative, or is it something else? Because for the real United Nations, they may encourage this humanitarian or cosmopolitan version of global citizenship. But for Model UN, it, things are different. So a lot of students participate in the activity just wanted to get an award and or experiences because this can be added to their CV, which will be helpful in the future. So things are quite different here. Um, okay, I'll come to the conclusion. I'll just say, uh, well, the three problems of work close. So I'll just show the slide here. And thanks very mm. much for, for your uh, listening. No. And I'll stop. Thank you very much. Uh Okay, so um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, my name's Haley. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge, and my research centers on environmental education, obviously, um, with a focus on climate and ecologically based philosophical issues in formal education. And I'm particularly interested in engaging with how ecologically focused pedagogies intersect with modern technologies. Um, and before I came to the UK um, for my doctoral studies, I was a school teacher <clears throat> in the US for a number of years. So Today, considering we're situated in this very unique era of both ecological crisis and technological advancement, I hope you're okay with taking a philosophical conceptual approach into the role of technology um, in education, which in this case means maybe asking more questions than we're actually answering. Um, but maybe the presentations that come after me will have some more concrete um, solutions for you. Um, since this session specifically is focused on education for sustainable development, I won't go too deeply into what that is, but Instead, I'm going to focus on ecocentric education, which is an increasingly growing research community within um, education for sustainable development that involves ways of thinking about education that center nature, not humans, and offers a little bit more room to um, make space for nature in an educational context. And <clears throat> a primary goal for many who do work within ecocentric education is to begin to seek a change in how we understand ourselves in relation to one another and the natural world. But one thing I've noticed in my research is that an examination of how ecocentric education intersect, intersects with the hyper technologically connected world we exist in is kind of lacking in the literature on sustainable education. There's not a ton of conversations surrounding where technology fits into the fold or into nature at all. Um, so these are kind of the two points of departure for today. So I'm going to try and briefly go over two tasks or issues that I'm thinking about. The first task is kind of looking at if ecocentric education's goal is to change the human nature relationship, then what exactly is or should this change be? Um, so in other words, what should the human nature relationship really look like? And then secondly, given that relational change, what does this mean for what role technology plays in this change or how our relationship to technology might change? So put more succinctly, if ecocentric education is focused on shifting the human relationship to nature, what does this require from educational perspectives concerning our relationship with technology. Um, so the first task, like I said, is looking at what this human relationship is or should be from an ecocentric approach. And in my research so far, I've come across a pretty interesting thread that thinkers from various backgrounds from all over the world, different time periods, et cetera, have basically agreed upon in their own ways and various different versions, which is that in order to be to effectively face the ecological challenges we have created, we need to embrace an ontological shift towards relationality um, and that education necessarily has a role to play in that. Um, so relationality really is referring to an ontology of connectedness, a view of the world that underlies how no person or thing exists in isolation, um, because existence necessarily means being in relationship. So this is the notion that we're all connected or intraconnected, that we exist in ways of connectedness that we don't necessarily understand. Um, but what's most interesting to me is how so many thinkers and traditions have landed here using different approaches. So um, I'll kind of demonstrate that. First, using a kind of Western philosophical approach. Uh, Bruno, Bruno Latour's actor network theory is just one of many that I could use here in this example. Um, but it basically kind of posits that any system we encounter can most effectively be approached if we look at all parts of the system, natural, technological, human, non-human, et cetera, as interacting and active members of the system. And that if any actor, regardless of its position, um, in that system is removed or added to the network, then the functioning of the whole network is affected or will be affected. 
Then we have, um, we can also see an African indigenous tradition specifically within the concept of Ubuntu, which has been widely and extensively written about within the context of environmental education and relationality. Um, Ubuntu essentially means once humanity is expressed in relationship with others, we are defined by our relationships, human and non-human. Um, there's this beautiful quote by MBT, I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am, um, which is much different, I'm sure, <laughs> you, as you can imagine, from a Cartesian, I think before I am approach, right? It forces us to exist in relationship. Um, and it also has a strong ecocentric leaning. It signifies the interconnectedness of all life while highlighting human to human relationships as a microcosm of relatedness of all things. Um, and then we can also take a more scientific perspective. We've got a lot of new research in quantum physics that's starting to change really how we think about the nature of reality. Um, Barad in particular focuses a lot on the concept of quantum entanglement, which in very overly simplified terms describes the relationship between two or more particles that are somehow linked regardless of their distance in time or space. And her interpretation suggests that the human, the non-human, they're all, uh, the, the, these worlds are all part of a common matter that has the potential for entanglement um, where humans and non-humans can affect and be affected um, by one another. So hopefully I've been able to kind of show that there are many different ways of coming to and understanding an ontological relationality. And I think it's important to acknowledge the roles that cyber technologies might play in any educational experience and search for resonance here, which I'm going to try and briefly do um, using two thinkers in technology who come from very different perspectives, but also take into consideration nature within their um, technological analysis. So first um, we can look at Heidegger who wrote about technology with the goal of really understanding its essence and with the idea that technology wasn't a problem, um, but modern technology was highly problematic. Um, and so Heidegger felt that everywhere we remain unfree and chained to technology. Um, and he believes that a free relationship with technology is one where we can really understand its essence and be able to see the truth of it and not just be blindingly creating technology without asking questions about it. Um, so he initially argues that the essence of technology is what he calls revealing, uh, that technology's essence is where unconcealment happens and truth can be accessed. So technology basically helps the world reveal itself to us. Um, but then he also argues that modern technology is different. Modern technology, he says, uh, is one of what he calls inframing, which basically describes this orientation or attitude humans have to the world, which is one that calls for a never ending and exhaustive revealing. And so as a result, he says, modern technology basically forces everything in nature to be what he calls standing reserve, which is basically this conceptual idea that nature should stand by until it can be used or called on us for our use. And so he argues that instead of helping something reveal itself and come into being, what modern technology basically forces or basically does is it forces things into being by viewing the entire world as a place to exploit the energies of nature. So I don't know that anyone would necessarily call Heidegger an environmentalist, but he did argue that we should free all that is standing reserve um, so that we can release modern technology from this inframing um, concept. And this argues for an openness to new ways of understanding this human nature relationship, right? Um, so it seems like there's something important here that Heidegger could be, could be telling us with regard to the climate crisis and our role as educators. He is arguing that if the human nature, human's relationship to nature shifts, um, if the human does not view nature simply as exploitative or as standing reserve, then the essence of modern technology will also shift. Um, it seems like maybe Heidegger could be offering some educational advice that to first begin to shift into a relational ontology, maybe it's the role of education to free our relationship with that technology because it's this unfree relationship that keeps us and the rest of nature as standing reserve. Um, but really what we see here is an urging to take responsibility for our current relationships with regard to technology and framing, standing reserve before we can even think about a shift towards a more relational perspective. Um, on the other hand, we can also look at uh, Donna Haraway, who's a feminist philosopher of science who brings, I think, a unique perspective to the table. Unlike Heidegger, who tried to free us from technology, Haraway instead is arguing we are technology. There's no separation between human nature and technology or machines. 
you know, I think it's a normal thing for us to say things like we are animals, humans are animals and nature, but Haraway takes it further by saying, listen, at this point, we're also machines. When I use a tool and it's an extension of my body, when I use my phone and send a message, it's a part of me is going out into the cyber world. I am as much tech as I am animal and nature, and there is no distinction. So this cyborg, uh, that metaphor that she comes up with is human animal. It's human machine. It's physical. It's non-physical. Um, and this mythical kind of metaphor creature, she argues, is about helping us take responsibility for restructuring the boundaries among human nature and machine, um, which I think is maybe where education can come into play. I wonder to what extent is, is the educator's responsibility to assist with this restructuring of these boundaries? Um, you know, according to Haraway, if ecocentric education seeks to change, cha uh, to change how we understand ourselves in relation to one another in the natural world, the cyborg has already done that. It's already blurred those boundaries, but the human that has this kind of ontological separateness from technology and nature hasn't. Uh, and maybe this is where the human is um, irresponsible in its boundaries. So I think Haraway is a lot closer to this ontological relational approach than Heidegger, but she's also making a compelling case that in order to enact change, we must embrace responsibility for what already is. So in a way, I think Haraway and Heidegger have similar concerns about technology, which I'm sure many of us share, um, in that it can do more harm than good if we don't necessarily take responsibility for it and rethink our relationship to it. Re relationship to it. And I would argue that education has a primary role to play here, although I have to be honest, I'm not yet sure exactly what that role is. Um, but to truly embody a relational ontology, which is ultimately what ecocentric education is often advocating for, education needs to play a role in this responsibility taking. So maybe it, the first step is to take a Heideggerian responsibility for the standing reserve, which will change how we think about teaching, learning, and approaches to formal education, or uh, maybe it's more of a Haraway approach for taking responsibility for what already is, that there's no first step, we're already in relationship and it's time for us to embrace a more cyborgic world, if you will, where we accept how we're interconnected in relation entangled with all parts of nature, the world, human, animal, non-human, elemental, cyber, quantum machine, et cetera. Um, I don't know yet. <laughs> maybe you'll have uh, thoughts for me. So I guess I'll, I can leave it here and maybe pose some questions as well for you all or questions that I'm really thinking about and wrestling with um, to see if maybe there are some perspectives or, um, that you have or anything that's resonating with you. Um, but these are kind of what's driving me right now, which is what pedagogical approaches might effectively address this relational responsibility? Um, to what extent do formal educational institutions bear responsibility for enacting this ontological shift? Uh, with nature, um, what role does technology play in our understanding of ourselves, nature, and the educational experience? And if ecocentric education is focused on shifting the human relationship to nature, what does this require from educational perspectives concerning our nature, uh, our relationship with um, technology? So thank you. So uh, it's very, we are very happy to be able to be a part of this community and we are delighted to present our project. Um, I'm Olga Mann, I'm a doctoral researcher at the Department of Education in Oxford and uh, my friend Aizuddin Mohamed Anwar, he just recently finished his PhD um, and is now a lecturer at Keele University. So we, today we'll be talking about proverbial wisdom, storing sustainability through proverbs from the global south. Our project is funded by the Institute of Sustainable Futures at Keele University. Um, and the aim of our, the project is to understand the local ways of knowing of how sustainability was con conceptualized in proverbs in Kazakhstan and in Malaysia. So in two contexts of the global South. And we want to understand um, not only how, for example, nature or the relationship between humans and nature were conceptualized in the proverbs, but we also would like to develop a new pedagogical approach based on the proverbs. Um, and we would like to um, organize a workshop, actually we're having it next week, with British University students, at, well, international students as well, all students <laughs> at Keele University, um, where we'll be, we'll be making zines and to, to introduce, I guess, arts-based methodology in sustainability discussions of proverbs in Kazakhstan and Malaysia. Don't worry, Jude will talk more about our analysis uh, later on, but I'll just focus on 
uh, briefly outlining why are we interested in this project and, and why proverbs. And I think the main goal was to, to highlight that um, knowledge of, on human nature relationship existed in, in societies, both Malaysian and Kazakhstan are post-colonial societies. So we are trying to highlight the local epistemic systems uh, before how, how basically important is to look at um, the knowledge from the two of these country contexts. Um, so yeah, we have analyzed, as you see on the picture, this is the picture of the books that we have analyzed. Uh, we have analyzed proverbs in multiple languages, um, in Malay, in Kazakh, and um, uh, these are the, the photos of the books that we analyzed. Um, as I briefly mentioned, uh, the first part of our project was to analyze the proverbs, um, around 30 proverbs in, um, in each context. Um, but the second part of our project is to, to do zines collectively with students, to then to interact with the knowledge um, based on the proverbial analysis. Uh, we have chosen to, um, to do zines with students uh, to highlight sort of this history of resistance um, and um, maybe in the Q and A discussion, we, we can we can talk more about the zines and the roles of zines in disseminating alternative knowledges. Um, but for now, I will transition to uh, talking about our methodology. So we have picked um, the framework of sustainability based on UNESCO, and we will be looking at three uh, strengths in sustainability education. One is the um, I, I broadly conceptualize it as alternative economic thinking. The second focuses on the social inclusion, and the third focuses on the um, uh, conceptualization of nature in, in sustainability frameworks. So my four, my four minutes are gone, but I'll quickly uh, uh, run through our methodology and timeline before uh, Jude uh, zooms in on the analysis, which is the most interesting part, I think. Um, so uh, we have um, fully embraced the colonial methods in our uh, project. We are relying on the Korean philosophy of Jong as the philosophical uh, framework of our project and methodology that highlights kindness between collaborators, but also uh, beyond human relations, right? So you can develop the uh, philosophy of Jong uh, towards um, human and non-human actors, such as nature. And the proverbs were analyzed by thematic analysis. Uh, we have at present analyzed 30 proverbs, 15 in each context, and uh, we plan to analyze 30 more. And um, Jude will zoom in on the analysis. Sure. Thank you, Olga. Um, I'm Aizuddin, or Jude for short. Um, so in our project, we are currently uh, in our phase where we have analyzed the proverbs. And we, like Olga mentioned, we'll be having a workshop with students next week with hope of assembling a collective zine and subsequently um, engaging in a public dissemination effort at a local um, arts organization that organizes a monthly climate cafe event. Um, so in terms of the analysis of the proverbs, uh, as Olga mentioned, we are looking at three dimensions of sustainability, namely economic, social, and environment, uh, following the UN um, kind of uh, categorization of elements of sustainability. So in terms of uh, analyzing the proverbs, we looked to look at the dimensions mentions across these three um, uh, components of sustainability and to try to map proverbs in both Kazakh uh, and Malay uh, onto these uh, relevant dimensions. Um, so in terms of economics, uh, largely it focuses on the notion of inclusive uh, growth, uh, long-term planning, uh, ensuring that there is cost savings and uh, attention to uh, cost of living, uh, as well as kind of uh, economic efficiency um, and um, and in integration with technology. In terms of social, it's to encourage uh, social inclusion, development of quality of life, uh, community development, and equal opportunity, as well as to focus on law and ethics uh, towards the notion of social solidarity. And in terms of the environment, to preserve the planet, manage resources carefully, uh, and engage in a sense of environmental responsibility. So uh, just to give a kind of sampling of some of the proverbs that we have uh, uh, included as part of our analysis, like Olga mentioned, we have so far analyzed uh, 30 proverbs uh, across both Malay and Kazakh along these dimensions. And here are a few of some uh, sample proverbs. 
Um, I can take one on the economic dimension. For instance, there is a Malay proverb which says, uh, which literally translates to you flinch when you buy something, but you win when you wear it. Uh, and this can be interpreted as a sense in which uh, we might invest in something that is a bit more expensive um, uh, at first, but it will endure in its usage over the long run and can be seen as a kind of critique against uh, the notion of uh, obsessive uh, consumption and 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 kind of uh, being judicious about uh, consuming and, and purchasing. Um, another example is the environmental one, a Kazakh proverb that translates to, if the land is blessed, the cattle will be milky. Uh, and this can be interpreted as carefully tending to the land that guarantees subsistence for animals and humans. And across all of the proverbs that we've analyzed uh, in both languages, we find that there is oftentimes um, uh, an, um, a use of nature as kind of metaphors uh, for thinking about questions of sustainability, even though the word sustainability might not uh, be used directly. So some other examples. Um, here are, uh, again, you see references to uh, shepherding, to water, to uh, elements of geography, and taken together, they, they gesture to uh, various dimensions uh, of sustainability. So overall, we find that based on our pre preliminary analysis, many of the environmental proverbs point to the importance of water as a resource and attention to local environment and reflecting on uh, the source of uh, a human flourishing and catastrophe in relation to the environment. Proverbs related to social uh, inclusion talk about the importance of unity, solidarity, uh, gratitude, and also diversity in thinking and action. While proverbs on economy focus on cherishing kind of small economic wealth, a sense of long-term outlook and patience, and prioritizing equality and social cohesion uh, over personal, financial, and economic gain. So based on these proverbs, what we intend to do is then to engage uh, in a workshop with students, um, which we'll have next week at, at Keele University. And the goal is to engage students to uh, reflect on these proverbs as a way of uh, trying to tell stories uh, through the practice uh, of Z making. Uh, and the hope is that we will use this workshop as a kind of prototype to build a new pedagogical tool that will be embedded in other modules um, at university level, where students are able to discuss across uh, not only uh, communicative languages, but also disciplinary languages, um, and how they can engage with these proverbs. And hopefully it will lead to a, a larger scale project um, on um, sustainability um, proverbs and also Z making. So as Olga mentioned, this project is funded by the Interdisciplinary Seed Corn Fund from the Institute of Sustainable Futures uh, at Keele University. So we'll stop there and, and take any kind of preliminary questions. Um, so the title of my research is Challenges and Opportunities in Climate Change Education. Um, that's kind of the, the overall title of my project. I started kind of my EDD journey back in 2019. So since then I've been doing, I did a pilot study in 2020 and I've actually done quite a lot of my data collection. Um, and I'm now kind of analyzing the data. So one part of that research is looking at teacher perspectives, but I've kind of been looking at other things as well. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go through. My main job though, I'm actually a secondary school teacher. So I teach key stage three to key stage five. Um, or age range kind of 11 to 18 okay um, and I teach geography as well maybe you can guess so there you go so the foundations of this research are kind of built around climate change um, and particularly secondary education and as we know climate change is one of the most critical issues at all government levels across the world threatening the very existence of the planet on a variety of different scales yet while the evidence of climate change is largely undisputed, how to deal with the impact remains a pretty complex and global problem. And in 2015, the landmark Paris Climate Agreement was signed with a long-term goal of being um, able to keep the increase in global average temperatures below two degrees because the impacts of this would be devastating, not only for our land, but also for our oceans and atmosphere. Uh, Article 12 of that Paris Climate Agreement, you can see there in the green box, clearly states that parties should cooperate in taking measures as appropriate to enhance climate change education and furthermore article 6 of the UN framework convention on climate change directs countries to consider education training and public awareness as intrinsic responses to climate change 
Education, therefore, is seen as an essential factor in the urgent response to climate change, not only to provide an informed response to environmental problems, but because solutions to climate change tend to focus on mitigation and adaptation, both of which require an informed level of education in order to theorise possible new strategies. So during the first kind of stages of research back in, I say this was kind of 2020, I did a pilot study before I kind of decided on what my focus was for the actual research. And I did a pilot study with students um, and I was interested in kind of their perceptions and how they felt about climate change and who they thought was responsible for kind of leading change when it came to climate change. What were their thoughts and feelings on it essentially? And it's a really, really interesting study. So you can see kind of some of the answers there when I asked them kind of what they thought about climate change, the words they were using were, you know, uh, kind of depressing, worrying, concerning. I say all negative responses, but then I don't really know what a positive response to that question would actually look like. And um, they said that they felt, you know, big corporations were responsible for leading change. And because they weren't seeing that within kind of the media or around them, um, they did therefore felt kind of like their own personal actions were a bit lost and pointless. Um, and one big thing that kind of came out of that pilot study was about eco-anxiety. Um, this feeling of worry and nervousness triggered by an awareness of ecological threats that we are facing due to climate change. So I did that pilot study and kind of thought about, well, as an educator, as a teacher, well, what are teacher perspectives on climate change? You know, you spend quite a lot of time, well, I spend quite a lot of time talking to children, asking them how they feel. But as a school, what are the staff feeling about this? Is there a different viewpoint or the perspective different? Um, and I think actually there are quite a, a lot of opportunities here to look at kind of teacher perceptions, particularly in relation to kind of teacher training and CPD curriculum planning, opportunities around pedagogy and how climate change should be taught. And also there are opportunities for kind of cross curricular links and links to kind of social justice and transformative education. Um, and that first presentation we listened to about ecocentric education and I spent quite a lot of time actually reading on that and that fits in really, really well with some of the work I've been doing with students um, and kind of some of the conversations I've been having as well with senior leaders. So from there, um, one of my methods was to kind of produce a staff questionnaire which was split into four questions some of the questions you can see see there but it was 40 questions long so definitely couldn't fit them all on that powerpoint slide but the main aims of kind of the sections were to kind of gauge perceptions around climate change what were their feelings towards it did they feel kind of personally impacted by it how did they see the impact of climate change in their local area and their school community within the school what were their thoughts on um, the teaching of climate change, do they think it's a cross-curricular subject? Are there certain subjects that they feel it sits better with? Um, do they think or do they feel confident when teaching about it? Would they like more CPD in this area and what actually would that look like? Um, I also wanted to kind of ask about what their views were on student perceptions. Have they noticed a shift in attitudes among their students? since their time in teaching? Do they discuss climate change with students or vice versa and what kind of conversations are being had within a classroom and even outside the classroom as well in those environments where uh, we're not kind of um, stuck to a specification or, or a scheme of work? And then lastly, it was more about asking about what subjects they teach and kind of how long they've been in education. So the response rate was quite good. I had a 33% response rate. So it was 20 people replied out of the 60 members of staff we have in um, our secondary school here. We are quite, a, I say small school, we are constantly expanding. 59% uh, of teachers who replied to the survey were from the humanities and science subjects. And that kind of fits in with research about people who do teach in those areas being more concerned about climate change than maybe some of the other subjects. And that came through kind of in the, the questionnaire as well, when I asked, you know, what subjects do you think climate change should be taught in? Quite the common answer was geography and science. There was no IT or no sport or anything like that. 60% of the responses were female. And again, that links in with research that's been done about male and female perceptions of climate change and how females generally are more concerned about the environment than, than possibly males. And actually, I was quite happy because of the people who replied, there was a good range of people who've been teaching for one year, up to 10 years. So provided quite a very set of results that have been really useful. So the results of the survey were kind of analysed using, using Born and Clark's thematic analysis. And um, there's still a little bit of analysis to still go. So these are kind of the initial kind of thoughts 
and results that have kind of come from that research. So I've just kind of pulled out some of the main things um, from each section. So the first kind of section, section was about their personal feelings towards climate change. And of those surveyed, 40% felt they personally felt impacted by climate change, citing impacts such as rising energy costs, public transport, and the most common answer being change in weather patterns, which I thought was quite interesting. That was a very common theme. And 60% of people said they felt climate change had impacted the area in which they live, referring again to weather, but also to local government initiatives and legislation. For example, Liverpool Council have just announced um, a month or so before this survey was done, the building of a tidal barrage across the River Mersey as a source of renewable energy. And I think that was still fresh in people's minds, and that is a clear, visible impact that they, they can see. 40% of people also felt that their working environment had been impacted, and references made to the destruction of green spaces due to the school expanding and the COVID pandemic. Um, I've done quite a lot of work with kind of senior leaders at the moment looking at our green spaces because. Since COVID, obviously we had to go into bubbles and things like that, and we ran out of space and ended up having to put kids on fields and things like that, but it's just not recovering the way that it should, and we've kind of lost quite a lot of our green spaces at the moment around, around the school that we're currently in. Um, and then when asked about their feelings towards climate change, the most common responses included the idea that it's not taken seriously enough and that this is a significant problem for the future, and they are concerned particularly around the lack of certainty on the topic. And that supports research done by Oxfam, who surveyed both primary and secondary school teachers and found that 86% of teachers surveys were also concerned about climate change. And it fits in as well with some of the data analysis I've done in student perceptions as well. You know, it seems that both staff and students um, in secondary education are really worried about this and, and for the future. Um, looking at kind of climate change within schools, so 95% of teachers agree that there should be more teaching about climate change across the curriculum. However, when asked what subject climate change should be taught to him, the main responses were science and geography. And surely this highlights a challenge because surely students need to understand climate change from a variety of different perspectives. And simply just knowing the science and the causes of it just isn't enough. They need to know how to respond and that they need to know that from a, a very different viewpoint rather than just kind of a science point of view. It was also encouraging to see that 60% of teachers had included climate change in their lessons within the last year. However, the majority of answers gave, um, or most of the examples given, focused on causes of climate change and effects. And only two people gave um, suggestions that they talked about responses to climate change, which again, I think presents another challenge that we're not talking about those responses, both collectively, as well as kind of individually. Whether that's because of a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding and training, um, on that area, I'm unsure. So the main reasons for not including climate change within lessons were a lack of expertise. Quite often it was said that it was outside the subject area and it was not part of the national curriculum. And this fits in with the kind of political picture in England at the moment, as since 2010, the Conservative-led government have removed environmental education from the national curriculum, focusing instead on the economy over the environment. Um, and, you know, when asked if teachers felt prepared to teach climate change in lessons, only 50% said they were, and 90% then went on to say that they would like CPD within this area. But when asked for examples of what that might look like, they said they were unsure um, because they didn't, they, they didn't know what was out there. They weren't aware of what support that they could be given. Um, again, when asked about students, what were students' perceptions towards climate change? Um, they said that students were very, very concerned about it, that that also um, kind of links in with research that I've done with students, and there's a common kind of theme there of students being concerned. Most of the conversations, again, around climate change focus on the impacts and the causes rather than kind of the responses, but it was good to see the ideas of kind of sustainability coming through and those conversations and keywords um, because sustainability is a, a massive topic, so it, it's good that students are having that conversation you know, with teachers and using those words. 60% agree that student advocacy is important and a common suggestion for adapting to climate change within our school community is through the use of an eco-committee and student-based groups. So actually some of the work I've been doing with sixth form, in particular year 12, we did a green spaces project with the theme of reconnecting with nature. Um, and, and as I said, linked in with that kind of ecocentric education, taking people outside 
um, and being a bit more appreciative of, of the environment that we are in. So this is that's still an ongoing project at this moment in time. We're still working closely with the Eco Club, actually, but there's definitely um, some things to develop there. So the main aims of this research were to look at the perceptions of climate change education amongst teachers and to look at what they perceive their potential needs to be. Um, and then to kind of look at whether that links with student perceptions. Um, the main findings, so there's a clear concern for climate change and it's clear that climate change is not taught across the curriculum due to a varying number of restraints, not only for the fact that it's not part of the national curriculum. And it's clear that some staff lack specific training and expertise to teach certain topics and CPD would support the teaching of climate change, but what that would look like is probably something to think about going forward. So next steps for me are to continue to analyze this data in, in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm gonna analyze the student data as well and kind of look for relationships and um, kind of links between, between those two data sets. Um, and I'm also continuing to work as well with a group of students um, in school to hopefully kind of make the, the school more sustainable. So, yeah, I don't know if anyone's got any, any questions or anything like that. So um, I'm going to start off with the provocation because essentially I'm a teacher. So this uh, is uh, a garden I used to go to with my father. So every time I would look at this picture and I would every time think of a garden as an ecosystem, it would come to me that it cannot be just one plant, one herb, one shrub. It has to be some like a whole school or a whole system approach. So this actually is the founding uh, thought behind my research, which I uh, took with uh, with different uh, teachers across Pakistan. So um, this was a study I conducted as a part of my MPIL research. Uh, and it was titled Full Approach is Sustainability and Interventional Thinking Tool and its Intent. So research was uh, built uh, on my personal, uh, you know, uh, orientation as a pedagogue as well. Um, I'm a research scientist and I'm an international baccalaureate school leader. IB is a, as a framework. I'm going to be referring to it again as a framework because it's not a curriculum system per se. It's a framework. It's a thought process, which essentially in simple layman terms uh, promotes inquiry based thinking. Right. So I, uh, as an IB school leader, I was working as, as an IB school with an IB school as a school leader um, and I was pursuing an in education leadership and management. So I just brought down all my interests to a point of convergence, which was whole school approaches to sustainability. Um, why uh, I go, uh, went on with this uh, particular idea, so I'll just give you a brief, brief uh, rationale to what we uh, explored. Based on the literature review that we conducted, uh, it was discovered that there's a lack of empirical research when it comes to whole school approaches to sustainability, especially in the context of Pakistan, where I'm residing. Uh, there, there are a lot of researchers which have emerged in the context of Pakistan, including researchers on education for sustainable development, uh, which was centered around some of the schools. Some research were, researchers were concerned uh, were conducted with uh, higher, edu higher, higher education institutions, but I could not find any evidence on researches which were based with schools and which were around the concept of whole school approaches to sustainability. Um, second thing which actually, uh, you know, intrigued me was that in the domain of whole school approaches to sustainability, there wasn't any evidence, um, there wasn't much evidence to be fair, of mixed methods research. Um, as a researcher, I think my personal orientation is to was mixed pieces really into and building on that for um lastly i think the most important uh uh, and the pinnacle of this entire research was that I was an IB leader, and I really wanted to see that how IB, as uh, as a curriculum, as a framework, is is in, is investigating or um, better uh, integrating the concept of whole school approaches to sustainability. So uh, my personal positioning also, you know, played a huge role in terms of deciding the scope of this research. So. Um, I decided on that I'm going to be doing this research with IB schools in Pakistan because there is this is the first research has been done with IB schools, um, not only in Pakistan, but also in Asia. Um, also, there's no research available with IB schools, which is from the perspective of whole school approaches to sustainability. Um, so since I was very 
with well connected so i decided i'm going to go ahead with ib myp school which is the middle school section that comprised of grade 6 all the way to grade 11 so this is a bit of a demographic uh, situation which is on your screen that these are the schools i uh, went on and i did my project with so um since it was a bit of an extensive project i'm not going to be talking about all of its dimensions so i'm going to be focusing on how we actually went on um so uh, when when we started reading up on the uh, on different uh, dimensions of whole school approaches to sustainability i came across a couple of frameworks um the roots of the concept itself could be mapped back to the year 1995 uh, when uh, that there has to, in order for sustainability to be actually seen uh, in a holistic manner it is important that it is not seen is in silos it had to be a concept which is seen across the continuum from pedagogy to practice to policy to philosophy and last but not the least uh, action right so um, when I went to different frameworks there were four or five frameworks I came across and um, while going through those frameworks I did identified some um, some um, gaps which could have been built on so the first thing so this research had three stages in the first stage of the research we did an extensive literature view of all the frameworks which were already existing we studied their dimensions and we tried to find gaps absence in each absence trends we devised we we include the supervisor we devised and proposed um, a whole school approaches to sustainability framework uh, which consisted of five dimensions um then we went on and we tested that with uh with the you know developed further more dimensions which were used in her quantitative survey that quantitative survey was sent out to all ib schools in pakistan and teachers voluntarily participated in that survey and the findings of that survey were used to uh, furthermore you know build another intervention which was a series of workshops so uh, in this particular present presentation i would be touching upon those dimensions but my focus would remain on the tool because i think that has emerged as a part of Buster's re this research as a knowledge contribution which needs to be talked about um so this is the framework uh, we proposed uh, this is adapted from uh, dr wall's framework of whole school approaches to sustainability with one uh, addition which is on transformative action uh, earlier frameworks did talk about pedagogy and practice philosophy and culture capacity building and community as well uh, in one way or another but transformative action which is through agency voice and choice is something that we developed as a dimension and we decided based again on lit literature review and uh, earlier studies which had been conducted in the field of education for sustainable development that in order to uh, have a school system or to to evaluate uh, a system which promotes sustainability in all its paradigms transformative action has to be at the center of it so uh, this was the framework this was the thinking tool we went and we developed a quantity to 105 across five and then mentions uh the road uh, the first step was the and sending as a survey with uh 46 teachers and then we improved some of the findings we we made sure that there's no you know um we made sure that the, it is authentic and it's reliable uh through the use of spss and then we went on to test the findings through semi-structured interviews with the teachers um after those interviews uh, we developed a series of workshops, which was a uh, four module long workshops which was conducted with different schools in pakistan and um, those results were again consolidated in the form of the outcome of this research there's no uh now uh indicated in the concession we're having problems with your sound um, this was not on so we're having some problems with your uh, okay am i audible yeah yeah okay don't need to finish in two minutes am I audible? okay Okay, so um, so essentially the dimensions talked about philosophy and some of the teachers indicate that law culture is essential for starting off with uh, sustainability in all dimensions, but most of the teachers indicated the need of having capacity building, which is rooted in the concept of sustainability and not just uh, by talking about it in terms of curriculum, but in all dimensions, which includes community service, which includes student transformation, which included uh, policies and all of that. So we kept that as a focus of our workshops. I'll quickly schedule towards the conclusions uh, of and the implication of this research, which I think are very important. 
So the, these are the key findings that we uh, that evolved as a part and parcel of comparing the quant and qualitative data. Um, um, in terms of the philosophy, in the absolutely vital to the vision of any school with sustainability. So, because the curriculum in, in isolation cannot really support that. Similarly, in terms of curriculum, uh, the concept of interdisciplinary learning emerged heavily. Also, most of the teachers indicated that the use of personal projects and community projects could be conducive towards promoting such researches uh, and also promoting these capacities in the students. Similarly, um, Almost most of most of the student teachers, as well as the uh, school leaders, um, indicated that there is a need of sustainability focused workshops also within IB um, to train teachers to be able to be thinking about these dimensions in a holistic manner, rather than thinking of it in a segregated fashion. Um, similarly, um, in terms of community service, uh, some interesting findings uh, talked about community as a source of reflection. So they did talk about uh, incorporating parental feedback within their classrooms because the final outcome has to be that it has to be whatever is being taught in the school needs to be reflected in the society as well last but not the least uh we could not really go in depth of the transformative action element because we kept it as a part of the last module so but still uh the findings indicated that teachers indicated a need of promoting teacher agency for in order for schools to be able to truly reflect wsa which is whole school approaches to sustainability similarly they also um indicated a need need of having cultural shift through uh, the use of pedagogical interventions uh, to be able to reflect WSA in all dimensions. Last but not the least, um, I think the implications of this study, um, I'm, I'm still working and building on this study because uh, that, that was my project. And right now I'm working with different schools to further, uh, you know, on its uh, implications. But uh, this research has left us with three tools. One is the thinking, uh, thinking tool, which should serve as the starting point for conducting the research, which actually gives a roadmap for uh, to the practitioners and the research just to think about that these are the dimensions they can interplay with. Um, the second uh, contribution of this study is of pedagogical nature, which is the professional development intervention, which is the workshop series that we developed. Um, that is an open resource. Uh, we are more than happy. We have actually written to schools in Canada and Europe to use that in their context and send us the findings. So we are, that is one intervention that uh, is out there for the world to use. Last but not the least is the qualitative survey. Uh, that's also something that can be used not only with IB schools, but also after some modification can also be used with other frameworks around the world. Um, so that's all from my end. I am open for questions, if any. Thank you. OK, thanks, Arush. Yeah, you're, you're, um, it might be useful if you turn off the, your camera now, because I think what, there were one or two problems about hearing all about yourself, but it was, it was great. Thank you very much for what you covered. A lot of, lot of, a lot of things. I think in the couple of minutes we've got left before we go back to the main group, I, I've just got one sort of question really, which is, it was part of the question, more of an observation that you mentioned about professional development and that's come up quite a lot with, with people on it. And do you think, because the nature of IB schools are quite distinct in terms of how they are, the topics and themes are approached. There are um, issues and reflections from the approach with IB schools that might have broader applicability, or, or do you still think there's a tendency for teachers to think in very subject focused ways? Because I think people, you know, some of the presentations have talked about sustainability, environment, and climate change in a much more holistic sense. Uh, I think based on what the teachers indicated, IB obviously gives you this advantage that you can interplay with it, right? You can experiment with it because the curriculum is not extremely rigid. But the module that we developed, uh, that actually has, uh, at the end of it, I'm just going to let you know, that it has a project which is to be built by the teachers, which uh, has all the dimensions mapped out, and they think of the solutions of those projects within the context of their school. So the module was also devi devised with uh, keeping sustainability competencies in mind. Uh, uh, and I think this is something that can be replicated with other framework as well. But uh, to what extent would that be a successful venture or not? That entirely depends on the context of the school. Um, I cannot make this claim that this is something that can be holistically applied across the world. But yes, adapted versions of this toolkit can be used with different schools from different uh, framework. 
Um, so that's my response to that. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to opportunities for testing it out with other frameworks because I'm uh, in, interested in testing it out with schools in Scotland. I've written to some colleagues in Europe. Uh, so uh, do let me know if there's anybody who would like to reach out. Uh, I'm putting my email address on the last screen. If anybody would be interested, uh, you can reach out to me and write to me. I'm more than happy to collaborate. Okay, so welcome back, everyone. The main session we had a very interesting um, discussions in the one I was involved with on education for sustainable development. And I'm going to pass on briefly to Andreas to say a bit about the early career network um, and their plans for the future. Yes, thank you very much. I will quickly share our slides. You should be able to see them now. And I think maybe also very quick for me as somebody who participated in the session. I think it was very interesting. It was very fascinating. You know, I made many notes. And I think one of the common, you know, maybe concerns is that we didn't have enough time, you know, that we would have liked to engage more in these type of discussions that we would like to dive deeper. And so I think that's, that's a very shared, you know, impression that many of us have. And so we thought it would be very nice to create like a network for early career researchers. And maybe before we go into what we're trying to achieve and how we try to achieve it, we want to very briefly introduce ourselves so that you, you know, can see we are also just early career researchers. You know, we have the same kind of struggle and issues like probably many of us go through. So for me, I'm Andreas Rockler. I'm originally from Germany, but currently doing my PhD at the University of Oulu. And I'm mainly looking at um, virtual mobility as a place to create, you know, global learning opportunities. And I'm especially interested in informal learning. So I'm currently organizing or setting up a collaboration with two Japanese universities where I'm creating a student circle. And you know, I'm joined today by you know, two other PhD students. The first one is Dobrava. Can you quickly introduce yourself? Um, hi. Um, also, thank you very much for interesting presentations. I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Warsaw. Um, my doctoral research focuses on comparative studies on global education between Poland and Portugal. I'm the most interested in teachers' experiences and teachers' understandings. And uh, I'm a qualitative researcher. Thanks. And the last person who, you know, is, is yeah. part of this group in this very initial stage is Rika. Yeah, hope you can hear me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just outside. <laughs> it's lovely weather. Um, so my name is Rika Suhonen, and I'm from Finland, University of Helsinki. It's now my third year doing PhD research. And my focus is on... Um, or the context of, of global citizenship education, I'm looking at vocational education and upper secondary level uh, vocational education. So how are global issues dealt there? Um, but maybe we'll go on talking about some ideas that we think could be interesting for the network. Um, so Andreas, you can continue. And you know, hopefully if we are successful in creating this type of network, then there will be plenty of opportunities to you know talk about our experiences, our interests, you know, to learn from each other because one of the great things about meetings like this is like, like as mentioned earlier, this diversity of different perspectives coming together. But yeah, maybe just briefly going through the goals that we had in mind when we first came together, when we first discussed. So we want to connect early career researchers that are interested in topics related to global citizenship education or you know, topics that you know the angel network is looking at. Um, we created a small survey because we want to understand the needs of early career researchers, you know, what, what kind of support are we looking for? And, you know, how can a network, for example, support early career researchers? Um, we will talk about this a bit later too. We want to empower early career researchers to actively co-create the network. So it's something where we're thinking more of a bottom-up approach, not a top-down approach. And, you know, we want, to, we want it to be very inclusive, you know, so that people can bring in their perspectives, their expectations and their needs. But, you know, to sum it up, basically, we want to create a common space where, you know, we can work together, we can, you know, support each other, where we can, you know, communicate, study, where we can, you know, motivate each other. And so, like, our first ideas of how a network like this could look like, how we could do it, like we were talking about, we want it to be less formal, more casual. So we want to have a more of a focus on, you know, the relationships between the, you know, early career researcher who would join the network. We want to focus, you know, we want it to be a very supportive space. 
So we want it to be a network where you can also be vulnerable, where you can talk about, you know, issues that you have might have with your research process about, you know, insecurities that, you know, we are all encountering, but it's always nice if you have a, if you can talk with somebody who has similar experiences to you. So we want it to be relatively open and flexible, which again means we very much want to draw on your feedback, on your expectations, what kind of hopes or desires or wants you would have. And that, of course, can also mean that, you know, if you are successful in creating this network, that, you know, new generations of early career researchers can then also bring in their input and, you know, the network can then be evolving based on their input. Yes, we want to be focused very much on the connections between different students and on cooperating. So, you know, it's more casual, less academic. And, you know, which doesn't mean that it's not, we can still, you know, this is something where we've been waiting on your input. So if there's an interest, we can, of course, also try to organize, you know, sessions like today or methodology sessions. But, you know, it's more about this kind of more casual supportive environment is how we envisioned it. And that's also why we wrote with rotating leadership so that different people, you know, can take initiative, different people can bring in their inputs. And, um, you know, I think we see ourselves more as kind of facilitators, you know, helping to set it up, not necessarily, you know, as leaders of the program. And so maybe talking a little bit about our approach, let's maybe look at how, you know, what kind of potential ideas the network can have. Uh, so yeah, uh, the potential ideas for the network so far would be um, formal part, which would be academic networking, which would be, for example, uh, finding co-authors, research partners, maybe sharing research publications. Um, other, which would be less formal, would be, for example, um, a peer feedback which would be reviewing papers and research ideas, maybe mock presentations or brainstorming ideas. Then we thought of uh, sharing information, uh, which would be, I don't know, a list of relevant journals or um, job or writing opportunities, or maybe conferences or summer school that would be adequate for early career researchers. Uh, we also thought of uh, creating something like reading circles that would, where we could discuss latest research, um, all or learning uh, sessions uh, where we could have some workshops or seminars for early career researchers, and they could be methodological, theoretical, or more practical, for example, how to write an article. <laughs> um, uh, the creating community was a big part for us. As Andreas mentioned, we would like to focus on uh, connections and relationships. Um, so we thought of ideas like uh, virtual coffee breaks, but something more regular. Um, maybe mental health support uh, or work tips, if of course there will be a need for something like that. And um, we thought of also um, to have space for writing opportunities, which um, might be a blog or a newsletter, depending what we agree on. Uh, but also we thought of something like um, a regular, regular joint writing session uh, that would motivate us to work together, let's say once a week for two hours. Of course, everything is um, adaptable. Everything is um, up to co collective decision. And that's why we also left the question mark in the end because we are open for any suggestions. What we have here now, it's just, our initial thoughts. So please <laughs> fill in the survey and share with you if you have any ideas. Thanks. Yeah, so the survey link was uh, already shared to you on the chat. Let us know if it doesn't work for some reason. Um, so we can still double check. But the idea really is to get uh, hopefully your feedback. And then if you know other early career researchers who were not able to join today, please forward <laughs> the message to them. Um, so it shouldn't take very long. There's multiple answers, but also some open uh, responses for you to fill in your thoughts. And we would hope to have your responses by 15th of May. So there is a few weeks time. But yes, as I said, feel free to share the survey. That's very important to your friends. Um, so we'll collect the findings, uh, what you have written, what you have wished for, and then present them uh, first at the Angel Conference in Paris. So if you'll be joining there, uh, there's a dedicated session. Maybe we can go to the next slide already. So there's a dedicated session 
um, at the Paris conference um, on, on Tuesday 20th of June in the morning, if I remember correctly. Um, and there should be a pre-registration as well. So we try to, because we want to make it a quite interactive session, so it can't have like a huge amount of people, but we hope to have, of course, many people there. Um, so we'll talk about the survey findings, but then also have other um, kind of interactive parts where we can get to know each other, uh, network, brainstorm, um, know about each other's research as well. Uh, so create, starting to create this community. Um, but if you're not able to make it to Paris, you know, it's, it's limited uh, spaces there. So we'll also share um, the survey findings and the Paris kind of brainstorming ideas later on through angel channels. So don't worry. But it's a very good thing if you fill in the survey. So then we have your contact information as well through there. Maybe the next slide for our thank yous. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we really hope, I'm sure... Um, I already saw in the chat that many people were excited about this opportunity and uh, we really hope to have many of you joining the network and thinking together how we can create a community to support each other. An early career researcher, by the way, <clears throat> is defined as could be master's student, PhD student or six years after graduation of PhD. If, thank you so much. So we are out of time just very very briefly i just wanted to thank all of you all the participants all the presenters uh, that was great a very great and important uh, uh, discussion and this demonstrates that there is a, a growing need of exchange and peer-to-peer -peer communication uh, among early career researchers and the early career researcher community this growing community is providing a great uh, uh, contribution to the over to the whole debate on global education and learning. So I'm, I'm, I, we as Angel are very happy about the success of, of this event, and we are, all, we are also happy to see and to facilitate the growing of this of the grassroots community of of early career of early career researchers. As you know, we have a, a type of membership of early career researchers angel membership. We organize every two year, every other years, uh, um, early career researcher event. That, that that this past year was a summer school. Could be an event. Could be an, a conference or a workshop. And um, and we are very very happy, very excited to to see this growing movement of uh, of. People that wanted to early career researchers that wanted to organize themselves as a as a as a sub network. Uh, therefore, we'll see you in uh, all of you in in Paris. And based on the survey that Rika uh, mentioned, uh, as anticipated by by Rika, we have a space in uh, in in Paris for continuing continuing this discussion because uh, yeah, we as Angel are more than happy to provide this common space for discussion among early career researchers. Thank you everyone for being here today and see you hopefully in, in Paris and, and, and let's keep in touch. I think today we've seen the value, of, the value of networking. We've seen the value of that there's great wealth of research taking place in our field of global education and learning, global citizenship and education for sustainable development. And I think one of the very benefits, hopefully for all of you, for Angel, is the ways in which you can not only share um, your research and ideas, but you can learn from others but, and do so in a space that can be hopefully um, supportive and welcoming to everyone. So thanks everyone for your participation, engagement, and thanks everyone for your comments in the chat. And we look forward to seeing you all soon at our future events. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>